That's it. I believe yeah. that's our cue. Hello, everybody. Oh yeah. Seasons greetings to you and all that. Two yeah. weeks in a row of drinking. Can you believe I it? I feel like we should make this a regular thing. It's quite, I, it seems to be working out quite nicely. I don't want to scare people into thinking that they shouldn't be drinking that much, but maybe, maybe think about it, you know? I mean, I, think... I wouldn't want to imply we haven't just been non-stop drinking between the two streams. I mean, it's the holiday season, and to be fair, like, exactly. if you're going to scare people about drinking, you should scare them into doing more of it, really. Yes, that's it's the, the way. <laughs> it's the best way to cope with modern life, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, so suitable, considering what you made me do. Oh yeah, yeah, we will talk about that. Uh, just for, for reference for everyone, I forced Mahler to watch all four episodes of Willow that are out at the moment, and uh, well, it was a traumatic experience, I think. Forgiveness no. is complicated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you actually sent me a text just saying, I think you've hurt me deeply. <laughs> Yet what? another fucking franchise down the whatever. Anyway, yeah, do we have guests? <laughs> we do, yeah, we should bring them in. Uh, just before we do, actually, tonight's uh, live stream brought to you courtesy of Jennifer Lawrence, who invented not just Open Bar, but also YouTube, the internet, and humanity. So, uh, yeah, um, we should thank her for that, I suppose. Proud of um, you, Jen. Thank you, Jen. We wouldn't be here without you. But anyway, we do have guests, so let's indeed bring them in. We have got the one and only Az. Az, Hello. stop masturbating there. You're on, you're on stream now, mate. Az, Az. Go <laughs> get your head in the game. Get your head in the game. Oh, no. You caught me in the middle of the... <laughs> oh, no. We'll, uh, I'll put him in timeout for 30 seconds. That'll be enough time to finish up. 38, if that's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've got to play the long game it. sometimes. Yeah, I'm cleaning my keyboard as we do this, so there you go. Oh, dear. Uh, hello. Smooth. I didn't oh. watch Willow. You couldn't fucking pay me if you tried to watch that. You would have watched it if Be a Drinker had asked you to, right? <laughs> well, if... you did, you, but you didn't. We, we, we could have well, we, we could have put the peer pressure on you and said, "Well, everyone cools watching Willow these days." Ask, come on. We should have, oh, dude, We should have gaslit him. We should have said it was great, and that everybody's been lying to him. And it's so yeah. good. It's the best it's, show ever. Instant drinker recommends. I would actually make a drinker recommends <laughs> video of it just to get as on board. No, and then I'd fall in the trap, and I'd be like. You just have this like awkward opening to the stream where as is looking at both of us like so you, you, what what did you what what was what character did you like? <laughs> We're just like, well, oh, all of them as are you kidding? Everyone. <laughs> oh no. I actually, I did watch National Treasure though, two episodes of that. And I had Ooh. to watch the second episode almost twelve hours apart from the first. The first was so bad. And then oh, the was well, uh, uh, not on the inside. <laughs> Well, we're all dead on the inside, let's be honest. <laughs> That's why we do what we do. Well, we've also got another guest who has also seen National Treasure and Willow, so we should bring him on. He can tell us his experiences. He's also dead inside. <laughs> well, he might also be as well. <laughs> we have got Little Platoon. Welcome back, sir. Good evening. Yeah, no, I am still comatose after that mm -hmm. session yesterday. Um, so I, I watched, how many was it? No, four, uh, three episodes of Willow. Two episodes of National Treasure, that's all back-to-back, -back, while editing part three of a Wakanda Forever video and writing an introduction script for Avatar, which is one of my least favorite films ever. So, yeah, that's all in the space of a few hours, and I haven't recovered yet. I think you've proven, though, to all of us that there is not an absolute limit to the amount of shit that a person can endure. Like, you've, you've managed to get through all of that, and you're still relatively sane. I'm, I'm testing you that limit. past Rings of Power, you know? Uh... <laughs> It's like being like attached in the middle of the human centipede, and the, the shit just oh, goes dear. in and then straight out the other side into somebody else's mouth afterwards. <laughs> well, we can definitely talk a little bit more about, well, human centipedes, but also... Uh, <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> 
was first the time one topic I said we're not talking about, okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no more human centipedes, damn it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, we begin this open bar on a somber note. We are saying goodbye to the possibility of Henry Cavill returning as Superman. Um, what a shit show. After he was told to announce that a new Superman movie was going to be happening, he was going to get Man of Steel 2... Uh, the the film we'd been waiting like five years for was finally going to happen, and then the other day, pfft, nope, it's done. I'm he's been retired as Superman. Thank you, James Gunn. Thank you very much for that. Um, wow, <sighs> shit news. It just seems like uh, you're not paying enough attention. It, it it seems like like have you not noticed how much everyone really really fucking likes him? I'm just saying, man, it's money on the table. I know I know that from a business standpoint, a lot of people could be like, well, but people won't understand we're going for the hard reset if he's still there because they'll be like how's that work and it's like you can make it work you got the flash you can do the multiversal flame flam you can do whatever you want to get a full reset you could have kept him the one thing i'll say is that like does this rule out any possibility of him being a part of dc in any stretch of the imagination to being superman because what he said made it sound like he will never don the cape again I, I think if they're talking about doing like a, a movie or a series of movies with like a younger Superman who's just starting out, because you know, if there's one thing we need, it's another fucking oh. origin story for Superman. I want that, and I really want to see Bruce Wayne's parents get murdered again. Because <laughs> I not need had to see those that. pills drop, dude. I gotta yeah. see it again. <laughs> but, but if you're talking about doing that, by the time all that's out of the way, like Cavill will be mid to late forties. It'll just be aged out of the role by that point this was the time to do it this was kind of the last shot to get him on board and they they didn't go for it but yeah like i agree with you 100 percent. you know the casting for these movies it's like they they picked some of the best actors in the worst movies you know cavill fantastic superman gal gadot excellent wonder woman you know <laughs> one movie was halfway decent the other one was absolute garbage um Jason Momoa, really good Aquaman. You know, even Ben Affleck, pretty good Batman. But they've all been lumbered with shit films, and so the, the actors themselves seem to be almost tarnished by the reputation of those films rather than just recognising, hey, we can do more with these people, we just need to get better scripts, we need to re restart this. Um, and it's such a fucking shame, because it's all getting this flushed. is what happens. You know, it yeah. is, it's all going down, uh, which is gradually going to get more and more news. We've already had pieces of other pieces of news to imply. It. The idea that Ezra Miller, like, there's no way that's staying, that's going as well. Like, everything, it's all gone. The Shazam stuff, like, they'll release the... They probably don't want to announce too much before these films come out, because it'll, like, hamper their, I guess, promotion and marketing, right? But as soon as they're done, maybe a month later, they'll be like, right, so... That's it. We're moving on. Bye. Bye, everything. That was an era. That was a different universe. Bye, everybody. This isn't happening anymore. Because um, some people are saying as well, like, make sure to mention, James Gunn did confirm he's not doing an origin story with Superman. It seems like the fact that he's even tweeting means he's got some awareness of what people want, but um, he must have clearly, noticed this was not going to go enough. over well. That's what I mean. Uh, I guess if... Because, you know, they, they want another Superman that they can bank on, probably, right? One that they can keep for a while. I'm talking, like, 10 to 20 years, even, potentially. Uh, and Lockheed may be an unknown. Yeah, probably a 10-year run would be the, the ideal, I would imagine. So you're going to want a guy late 20s, early 30s at most. But, yeah, man, I, I don't know. DC is an absolute disaster. And it's funny, because you'd be like, oh, because Marvel's so much better. It's like, well, Marvel... No, that's a disaster too. It's just a different kind. It's, 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 it's... Well, at least the difference with Marvel is they had probably three phases, you know, 10 years, I guess, a good 10 years of being really successful and producing mostly decent yeah. movies. Uh, DC's never had that. Like, it's just been false start after false start and like half awkward attempts to try and reboot it or, or you know, go in a different direction and then fucking the Snyder cut comes out and it's like, oh, okay, well, I guess we're going back to the Snyderverse then and whoop, that's been shit-canned again. And now, yeah, you bring in James Gunn and he's just like, forget it, everything's getting torched, scorched oh, earth, let's start back from the, the beginning again. I mean, I, the I Snyder fans the, are on life support right now, I think. That's the actually. one good thing to take away, because normally I'd be happy with anything that pisses off Snyderverse fans. Sorry to any Snyderverse <laughs> fans in the chat, but I hate you. Um, <laughs> it's... But that's that's the just the only justification I can find for it is that if you are James Gunn and you're coming in and you, you've got a planned story arc that's going to take you over ten odd years, 
what's the easiest way to go about that? Is it to try and pick up all of these disparate, very loose threads that have been created by innumerable directors, some of whom Zack Snyder are crap, um, and others of whom have been jettisoned like, like Patty Jenkins? Or is it to simply rip all of that up and go back in time to a younger Superman, really create from the beginning? And if that's where you're going with it, which I suspect is where James Gunn is going with it, is it even really possible to keep someone like Henry Cavill on as much as he's loved and adored because of all the baggage he'd be bringing in and the weird sort of narrative confusion that would arise from him being him heading a universe other than the universe he's already headed once? I, I think if it was up to me, I would have done a soft reboot. So I would have kind of vaguely acknowledge the things that had happened previously but just do my best to move on from it and not really mention them again and just start up a whole new say a whole new um, justice league arc a whole new superman trilogy perhaps uh i just try and move forward from there i just feel like he's too he's too good an actor to go to waste like that i feel like he could have been utilized like there was a way to salvage his superman and move forward with it, um, and it would just soft reboot it if we're in the world of hypotheticals and we can do whatever we want, it would have been really neat to maybe have one more movie um, uh, and just have it be... I'm not sure if we'd make it a, a primarily Superman movie or a Justice League movie, but to round it out and have some kind of Flash-related disaster thing, paradox, Flashpoint thing, that then brings in the new universe instead of... Uh, it gives it gives Henry Cavill one more chance to, to do the role. But the thing is, of course, you could be like, well, then who are we bringing back in totality for that? It's like... Well, we can still probably axe a couple actors. Some people are asking, is Amber Heard still in this universe? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> the, this, the, yeah, this thought. is the bizarre thing of like, okay, they're doing the next Aquaman movie. She's going to be in it. So we're now living in a fucking universe where Cavill has been axed, but uh, like Amber Heard is still there somehow. She is truly <laughs> the herd that won't flush. And it's just, it, it beggars the belief and stuff like this. What's the point now? <clears throat> because well, exactly. It, it, James Gunn's come in. He's he's made his decision with uh, Henry Cavill. He's not bringing Ben Affleck on as Batman, but he wants Ben Affleck to direct. Uh, Gal Gadot has now had Wonder Woman three scuppered. So what is the point in anybody going to the cinema and watching Aquaman two and The Flash? There is zero point. I think that's what Moore is saying is that they've gone. They've done everything except announce that they're doing a hard reboot of everything yeah, I'm imagining because they just want to get these movies out and milk whatever money they can out of it to try and offset their losses. The, and I think, writer. honestly, if they'd been earlier in development, they would have just done a Batgirl on them and shit-canned the whole thing. The writing's not on the wall. Them. We all know the reality, but they're probably not going to announce it because it'll hurt these movies in the cinemas, right? Like The realities of Aquaman, The Flash, and uh, uh, Shazam. Oh, they're probably going to delay... I think Ezra Miller's going to hurt The Flash, and I think Amber no, you, Heard's going to hurt Aquaman. You're absolutely own. right. It's just the, you know, the <clears> suits are like, so we're axing all of this, right? And it's like, when do we announce? And it's like, well, we probably should delay the announcement for these things until they get into the cinema so that the public... Because as you just said, a lot of people are asking that question. Why should I go see these films now when I know that you don't care about these stories? Like, they're getting mm. completely removed from canon, or possibly removed from canon. I don't know what the plan is, but... And um, uh, he... Gunn is lying this is an origin story it's it might not be an origin story of of the of clark landing and being grown up and then going to superman but all they're doing is just simply cutting that bit away this is an origin story that he said this is the first time he gets to meet lois lane this will be the first time he meets lex luther the first time he interacts with uh, perry white it'd be all of this stuff that is an origin story so however he wants to to gif wrap it it's an origin story. And then he said that Patterson is going to stay in his own universe. We know Joker 2's on the way as a Christ. musical with Lady Gaga. <laughs> so now we're going to not just be recasting a new Batman, uh, Superman, but a new Batman to go in. So we're going to still have two Batmans on the go. And if you're recasting Superman and Batman, you're not going to have Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. So she's going to get recast and there's going to be a Wonder Woman which means you're not going to have a Jason Momoa as an Aquaman, which this means that's yeah. going to get recast. And you know Ezra Miller's not coming back nope. because they've already said he's shit-canned. So there's a new Flash there. So the whole thing has it, just been an absolute disaster. And and this put this 10-year plan, don't make a 10-year plan. How about you make a good one fucking a movie? A good movie, yeah. How <laughs> about this you do is, that? 
they they are legit going to end up making documentaries about all of this period of DC's history on film. Oh, just I've got all the popcorn it. in the world to watch. Because honestly, like if you're some kind of like um, either an art student or like a an aspiring businessman or or a studio head or anything like that, this is like a textbook example of how not to launch a franchise. It's like they have made every possible mistake that a, that a studio can make with something like this. And here we find ourselves like this. Is, they have squandered some of the best characters, the best actors. Mm -hmm. They have just released disaster after disaster. The few successes that they've had, they haven't been able to capitalize on because they've either been like these weird outliers that are existing in their own universe, like Joker, um, or or you've had like these flash in the pans, like Wonder Woman, that was kind of successful for her first film. You know, it's it is. As you say, a complete disaster. They couldn't have got it more wrong with this. And yeah, man, I just, uh, I, I feel frustrated for all the people involved in this. I feel frustrated for guys like Henry. I, I feel so bad for him that he, yeah. he quit The Witcher, <laughs> probably thinking this was it. Like, I'm doing another Superman film. This is it. I'm finally going to have my time. <laughs> it's, and financially, this it's financially strange as well, because... You, you can see a justification if you're, as a lot of studios are going to be, now we've moved out of the era of silly money, very concerned about cash and outlay. You can see some kind of argument for, well, you've got a, a whole cast of very big name actors at the moment, that's a pretty hefty wage bill, you can cut that out if you're recasting and you're telling a younger story with younger characters, with new up-and-coming younger actors who don't demand the same wages. You can sort of see a financial reason, an incentive there, but then who's going to turn up to watch... Superman played by someone no one's ever heard of they've, compared they to Superman played by really Henry Cavill. Good. These yeah, have to be really good films. <laughs> they really do. They've actually put more uh, weight and emphasis on a good writing team, which is the thing that they've been most conspicuously lacking so far. Um, it, it could just go really terribly wrong. And then, of course, there's the whole Vex question of recasting anyway. Uh, it will be interesting to see who they actually pick in these roles now. Um, but I, like my usual sort of default response to any female character being recast is Phoebe Waller-Bridge, but I can't really see her as Wonder Woman somehow. <laughs> She's gonna have to hit the gym pretty hard. I do so, wonder as well, like with, you know, with James Gunn, like okay, we know that he can deliver individually good movies, and we know he can do TV shows like uh, like Peacemaker. But okay, can he like run an entire extended universe? Like that is a hell of a step up. For a guy well, like him, like, can he do uh, something like that? Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, I disagree with you on Peacemaker for a start because in Peacemaker, all Peacemaker did was actually rip apart legitimate superheroes, and and uh, Peacemaker ended up walking away berating Superman and Aquaman and the Flash, and these are your actual heroes. Peacemaker isn't your fucking franchise. Your Batman, your Superman, your Wonder Woman, your Green Lantern, your Flash. They are your franchise. They are your massive, your big, big dogs. And when you're creating these goddamn fuck, I'm sick and tired of these nihilistic shows which shit all over the actual characters that paved the way for 80 plus years so that fucking jokes like Peacemaker could come along and get themselves a little bit of a light. And this isn't a John Cena issue. This is just a, the way the characters are portrayed issue. So you are belittling your money makers while you're pushing these non-entities, which will not b exist in 10, 15 years' time whatsoever, but your Supermans will, and your Batmans will, and your Wonder Womans will. So stop making these shows which are uh, uh, deconstructing the superhero and start making some uh, shows or some movies that are constructing the superhero, because that's what we're missing. Because I don't want 10 years of... Well, I won't be watching it. But I don't want 10 years of deconstructed Superman that's been dragged around by Lois Lane. I don't want 10 years of a deconstructed Batman uh, where Alfred's talking about uh, his fucking privilege to him for, you know, all the time. I don't want that. I want I want optimism. I want, uh, I, you know, I want hope. hope uh, yeah. I want uh, to, to elevation. Uh, I want to be inspired. Uh, and I want to come out of that movie thinking, you know... I could, you know, I could, I could do better for myself by looking at these characters as an example. And we're getting none of that now. We're getting, we're getting the boys. We're getting Peacemaker. We're getting deconstruction. We're getting 
people who are writing the shows that don't even like the source materials, that mock the source materials. And we need people that love the source material. So the very fact that Henry Cavill walked away from The Witcher showed exactly, considering he's a dream job, how much of a farce Lauren Hestrich, Hestrich, uh, Hestrich and her fucking gaggle of uh, cronies there are doing. And the fact that he's been passed down now as Superman shows exactly how they don't understand that they have a man in his prime. He may be 39, but he looks 28. And by the time he's 50, he'll probably look 30 bloody five that you could still have done so much with that character that Henry Cavill's problem is he knows too much. He knows more about any of these characters than any of the showrunners that he's had under him and any of these directors that he's had under him. And the very fact that uh, he knows more uh, about them and can't, and can't influence the directors, the showrunners to actually portray the characters in the true light in which they are meant to be portrayed shows how we're lost. And, and and James Gunn's great, but he's great at quirky and offbeat. I don't want a quirky and offbeat Superman. I don't want a, oh, here's he, let's have some jokesy wokesy. Oh my goodness, losey lanesies. Oh my God, sees that's like literation sees. I don't want this sort of humor that he fucking brings into everything. You know, I want Clark Kent to be Clark Kent and I want Superman to be Superman. I want Bruce Wayne to be Bruce Wayne. I want Batman to be Batman. And we're not getting this and we haven't had it for so long. And when you pass up, when you kill the golden goose and there's no bloody egg, golden egg inside of it, I don't know what you're going to do going forward because I have no idea who right now in Hollywood you would cast as Superman. Bloody Tom Holland, <laughs> Timothy Chalamet. They're going to get some fucking scrawny ass fucking nobody. Henry's a man. Henry's masculine. Henry exhibits that. And he's got all the qualities that Hollywood hate right now. And that is that and, and it's so crazy that they have this person that should be rocking pretty much all franchises right now. He should be people should be clamoring to get hold of this guy. It's it's to me, I, I am so fucking done with this bullshit. If I can, by the way, you, you can't understate how fucking perfect he is. He's able to pull off multiple <clears throat> accents. He's got, like, the physique that's perfect. The hairline is still perfect. He's just a handsome-ass face. He can grow whatever facial hair you require. Mm -hmm. He's got interest in the source material for a lot of these roles. He can act. Like, I can't understate. This is like, why would anybody not want to pick this guy up for any role? He we, like... we, don't, we don't deserve Henry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it, too it good. Make sense, you know. It's just like he's he's money. He's right there. He's sitting. Well, there. as 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 people have pointed out to me before, like he has got the same um, the same agent as the Rock, and that that agent happens to be the Rock's wife. And so the the theory is that basically the Rock just gets the pick of every role going, and Henry yeah. just kind of has to pick up the scraps. And I, I don't think that's entirely untrue. There may be an element of truth to that because. Yeah, how many franchises do you see The Rock in? He's in basically everything. And yeah, Henry just, just kind of gets left by the wayside. And it's such a shame. Because like you say, he he really is the classic leading man that should be headlining mm -hmm. franchises. You know, he, he's got essentially everything you would look for in an A-list actor. And he's just not getting the opportunities. And the things he does go for, they're... they're they're shit. Like they're chronically you know, underused. Home. Like he gets, yeah. Well, he gets lumbered with people who don't understand the source material or don't care for it. Um, and you know he's desperately trying to steer them on the right track, and it leads to conflicts off, you know, behind the scenes. And um, yeah, he ends up having to leave. And it's man, I, I just don't know what the solution is for him. I don't know what role he's meant to take on. I mean, I I know what role I'd like to see him in since he's not doing Superman now and he's out the Witcher. It begins with B and ends in Ond, but like, yeah. I'm sure, you know, like you've said, as they'll probably cast some scrawny, metrosexual, fucking like waif of a man that, that's supposed to be playing this this ultra masculine character now because he needs to be updated for a modern audience, I guess. Um, and again, Henry will get overlooked. I, I just, well, Barbara, I don't Broccoli, know what he's supposed uh, to be doing. Barbara Broccoli has said herself that the next Bond is going to be more in touch with his emotions. <laughs> Yeah, I can't wait for that, because that was definitely what we loved about Daniel Craig's version, the brooding and the pouting. And the, I and the I, I'm just going to let myself get killed. I, I, yeah, I, I want this Bond to cry more than Kevin fucking Smith at a <laughs> corporatized 
Disney trash movie. The next Jeez. Bond, nothing but fear on that one. Just <laughs> this is oh one. yeah. I mean, I I think I'm 100 percent at that stage now with Bond, where it's like we had our run. You know that that longer than most that went for a good 50 years. We had some fantastic movies. Uh, it was inevitable. It was going to get swallowed up eventually, and I'm just well, I'm glad it lasted as long as it did. It was nice. It was nice while it lasted. Um, but yeah, like man. Press F in chat to pay respects to Henry Cavill's Superman because I don't think we'll see the like again. Um, I mean, I mean the, the, the one thing you could potentially hope for. It, it's very bizarre, by the way, being cast as the optimist in this scenario because I'm about as far from an optimist as you can get. But the one thing that you might note is perhaps, well, Henry Cavill, you know, announced this is what he wanted Superman to be. He wanted to tell an uplifting, positive story, to be a role model, to be someone that people would desire to emulate all the things that as listed. Um, and people resonated to that, very publicly resonated to that. That's why there was such a clamor and such excitement at the prospect of him coming back. And it's why, there, one of the reasons anyway, there has been such despondency at the news that he's now not coming back. If you are a studio worth your soul, you've got any eye on your audience at all, you will note that response and you will note that part of that response and you will attempt to inject that into whoever you get to replace Henry Cavill as Superman. Um, and, you know, James Gunn is not traditionally like a, a pessimistic, nihilistic, cynical director. If anything, he sort of goes too far the other way and being very sort of chipper and lighthearted and fun. But yeah, I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm hopeful for it, but if he has any... Uh, awareness whatsoever of the reaction to this and he should take that on board i mean you know hope. if it's a disaster it'll just be par for the course for dc right and it'll be curious to see where they end up going next as a result but i will be interested to see what happens next but i'm not sure i would have made these decisions but then again i'm not i'm not the kind of person that gets put in those positions so maybe there's a reason maybe i would tank it even further maybe james gunn knows exactly what he's doing I mean, I think we, I guess at this case, stage, we can at least conclude that he's not an idiot and he's not uh, an incompetent person. That's one good thing. Um, but yeah, like Warner, I, I guess they don't really have the the wiggle room to, to fail again and again from this point onward. Like, is the, the whole reason they're they heavily tanked, in debt. Well, mm. that was what I was going to say. Yeah, the whole reason they, they canned movies like Batgirl was because they just didn't have the money to keep releasing flops. It was easier to just write off the loss than to try and release a a failed movie. And so, yeah, they're at that point now where they, they can't just do a Marvel and have like a bunch of things flop in unison and it doesn't really matter because they've made so much money up until this point that they can absorb it. You know, they, they can't <clears throat> do that. And so you have to wonder, like, well... <clears throat> How many movies does James Gunn really have to play with here to get this new rebooted franchise off the ground before, again, it, they just run out of money and he, they have to say, well, we're done. We can't do any more here. I don't know. It, it feels like, though, that they're, they're at the last chance saloon with this one. Yeah. And they are uh, cash conscious as well. So when you had Dwayne Johnson come out and say, also The Rock, as we should probably call him, um, you know, Black Adam is not known as a great success, either in its own right or monetarily. And when he's coming out on Twitter and saying, well, actually, if you calculate it in this way, we actually Oof. did make money, guys. Hey, pay attention, James Gunn. My film's a moneymaker. Yeah. yeah. If it really was a moneymaker, it wouldn't be you announcing it on Twitter, though, would it? Well, you cannot go on and say, like, this $200 million movie made uh, $450 million at the box office, so it's a big success. Like, no, it isn't. That's nowhere near the break-even point for this. Yeah. Uh, that that lost a lot of money for the studio, and you know it, it it needed to be a massive hit because this was supposed to be the thing that was going to kick off the new era of DC on film. That they they hyped the shit out of this movie, like even like when I was in New York, Times Square, every billboard was Black Adam. Like <laughs> they were doing everything to push this thing and make it into the next Avengers, and like we kind of all sensed that it wasn't going to be like. No one really knew much about Black Adam, and no one cared that much about him. And I think they were they were they were trying to sell it on the premise of the cast. Really, it's got The Rock in it. It's got Pierce Brosnan in it. You know, it's got this this really awesome cast, and it's going to be a great team up movie. It's kind and of what a you strange got, movie looking back, isn't it? it? It's just an inoffensive movie. It's one of those ones that just made no real impact on any of us. I think we all watched it, and we were just like, hmm, it's all right. Nice, nice. Was cool. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's but, pretty much uh, all we could take from it. A lot of normies aren't going to know about the Justice Society of America. A lot of normies 
are not going to know who Black Adam is. So the movie's essentially to them being sold on The Rock, who's allegedly the biggest Hollywood star at the moment, and he couldn't bring people into the cinema. Yeah. And I think... Certainly not. Enough. You know, he, he's got a reputation as being, like, the franchise rescuer, hasn't he? Like, they brought him into the Fast and Furious movies, and, like, he really kicked them into high gear. Were, they, the were they dying or something? I thought they were doing fine anyway. They were, Well, he came in in Fast Five, I think, and so the, you had, like, the first three, and they, they were, like, law of diminishing returns, and I think Tokyo Drift was really the low point of the, the series, like, Fast Three. And then the fourth one came out, and I think it was kind of, it started to get them moving in the right direction like it was a bit more successful but it wasn't like a massive hit or anything and then fast five came out and that's when they basically locked in the formula it's like okay they're heist movies now ridiculous over the top action blah 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 like basically every movie after that point was the same uh, and that was the one where he came in and whether it was him whether it was just a combination of all those different elements that's what really made them like billion dollar movies beyond that point but yeah, I'm sure he Shaw helped. Bomb, didn't it? Did Hobbs and Shaw bomb? I don't think so. I would have thought it did well. Correct know. me if I'm wrong. I think it did pretty well. I because I think they're doing another and one, aren't they? Didn't oh, Hobbs right. and Shaw happen because of the Vin Diesel The Rock split, right? It did, yeah. Because basically, he didn't want to work with Vin Diesel anymore, and it's like, well, he's too he's too good to let go completely. What can we do? Oh, we'll just spin off this yeah, guy into like, his own film. Those two couldn't fit in the same room, basically. There's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of egos there. <laughs> they, they ain't family. <laughs> I know the whole like Vin Diesel family thing was like the like a played out meme within about five minutes, but I did love the the Superman meme yeah. version of it. It's like, what does the S stand for? Family. <laughs> no, I did uh, seven hundred and sixty million worldwide. That's not bad. I think that's probably all right. Better than uh, mm, Thor: Love and Thunder. That, that did around uh, out there, didn't it? I think it was... <clears throat> yeah, I don't think that got to 800 million, did it? <clears throat> I was going to say, though, when we were talking there, we mentioned... 745. Uh, what was it? 745? 745, yeah. So it oh, did, okay, around about did the same. Than, yeah. <clears throat> Love and Thunder, yeah. not get awards, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Oscars, please let it... not awards. Oscars, dear boy. <laughs> yeah, please let it get best visual effects. I dare you. <laughs> I want, best, I want best movie. Yeah, and the movie best movie goes to Thor: Love so and best, Thunder. God. Best supporting character: Korg. Taika Waititi directs. I would expect Taika to, to come up to the stage, grab it, and be like, "Why though?" Like yeah, himself, I just, he wouldn't understand. He knows. Um. Yeah. No. No shits given there. Uh, I was going to say on the subject of DC and all the reshuffling and stuff, we kind of touched upon Wonder Woman, uh, three basically getting cans. I was going to talk a little bit about uh, Patty Jenkins and uh, basically just self-destructing her career on Twitter. How posting embarrassing. An ex posting an I, extremely lengthy like explanation of everything that went on behind the scenes, which was really unnecessary. And just I wish to remind everybody, this is not unprecedented for her. She did indeed retweet someone in defense of her the rape scene in, in One of Women 84s. Some Twitter user tried to explain it and she retweeted them being like, this is it, by the way. It wasn't rape. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. It, it's like that, that kind of shit. You need to not do that. You, you got to just you got to let your film speak for itself at that point. But yeah, she, she is. Um... She's the living principle Skinner meme. It's <laughs> it yeah. Am I out of touch? No, it's the viewing public that is wrong. It's I mean, she I don't know what to say. She seems to have a history of like causing problems on pretty much every production that she's on. Like the Rogue Squadron went nowhere. Um, Cleopatra seems to have imploded. Oh. Wonder Woman three is oh. not happening. Like everywhere she goes, like disaster seems to follow her. I don't know what to say. Like she just seems to be a really difficult person to work with. And I still feel like whatever... Wonder Woman eighty four kicked all of that off. I feel like. Like, she was on top I, of the world? Because she got full control over that movie, right? That's the idea. I, I think, yeah, I think that was the major problem. Because I am willing to bet they held her hand every step of the way with the first Wonder Woman to make sure she didn't fuck it up. And that's why you got a pretty decent movie at the end of it. 
Yeah, wasn't uh, it a Taika Waititi scenario where she like she directed but didn't write the first Wonder Woman? So she then she did write and direct the second one, which is the one that bombed. Yes. Just as Waititi didn't write Ragnarok, he just directed it, but he did write Love and Thunder, which bombed. Um, and, there might be well, a lesson there in not giving talented directors sole writing credits as well, given that so many of them cannot write. I don't know where this came from. Like, at what point did we get to this stage where like directors were suddenly given writing duty as well? Because that didn't used, that didn't used to be a thing. Uh, superhero. Well, I, I, I don't know. Is it like egos? Is it just like suddenly directors get like one successful movie behind them, and suddenly they convince themselves that they can just do everything? Well, it's sort of the cult of the auteur, though, isn't it? Like all film directors aspire to be an auteur. It's not enough just to have your name at the front of the credits as director of film. You have to be seen to be responsible for all of it because then that's your true genius being appreciated by the audience. It's not just, here's what I can do with somebody else's talent. It's, look at how talented I am. I can do absolutely everything. I am the next, insert your favorite auto director here. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's a little sort of bit of cult of the artist of genius going on there, I think. And it, it's, a, it's a terrible idea that no one recently who's taken on that role has succeeded. I think Ryan Johnson's probably the most famous wannabe auteur who cannot write. And it's arguably he can't, he can't direct either. But you get another, a load of other people who do the same thing. YTT and Paddy Jenkins, I think, would be two other examples of that. Yeah. But I mean, with the, that first Wonder Woman, yeah, as far as I know, it was written by other people. And I'm willing to bet that she didn't direct half of it either. Those action scenes were not done by her. Like that, that scene of Wonder Woman going across no man's land, there's no freaking way Patty Jenkins directed that. That, when you... that was her, because she fought for that. The, um, Are you the sure? Action... Because when I compare yeah. that to the action scenes in, in Wonder Woman 84, <clears throat> that is like a completely different director. The style she is different. She, uh, she had to fight to get it into the movie. They wanted it cut from the movie. Uh, <laughs> she said she really? had to fight to get it in. And uh, she eventually uh, won a fight, obviously, because it got in. Yeah, yeah, there's a big thing when it, the movie came out, how she was talking about how... Because a lot of people said the favourite scene was the No Man's Land scene. And uh, and then so all of that started to, to come out, yeah. Wow. They wanted but, then is that a, but then is that an editorial dispute rather than a, a directing one? You know, is it a case that like, you know, it, it was shot know. and it was there and it's just like, well, we're in the editing bay now and we want to take this out for, for pacing issues or whatever and she just wants to keep it in? She I don't know. said she wanted to keep. She said she argued to keep it in, and I'm paraphrasing here because it was important and integral to the, the story of and the development of Diana as a character. So she she kind of said those sort of well, things. Well, no, that's and well, that's fair enough. I guess what I'm saying is like, did she say I worked really hard to direct this scene, and so I want to keep it in, or was it just like I recognize that it's a well directed scene that's important for the character, and so I want it kept in the movie. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, like I guess that's just wall, what I'm you know? asking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, mean, I, I get why you, you're bringing this up because Wonder Woman 84 is an absolutely disastrous mess in all aspects. And so it's like, how did that person make anything in 84? Because I'll concede, I, I'm not a fan of the first Wonder Woman, but 84 is much worse. Like, it, there's, there's an obvious decline, which is weird because you'd expect maybe that if she is let free and given time, you know, she ends up with something better. But the, I have a feeling it's damaged her actual career prospects at this point. Well, I think so, and I guess, that, like you said earlier, and you know, um, I, I could have, I could forgive the writing quality almost going down if the directing was still really solid, like it was still the same style as the first film. But it's like even that is so much worse, and it, it makes me think, okay, maybe she didn't do a lot of the first film, and it's like suddenly she's unleashed, and it's like this is what she actually can do as a director, and it's not very good. Um, but either way, however it came about, yeah. That movie flopped, um, everyone hated it, and it's pretty obvious to anyone looking in. Like, the studio recognized that she'd fucked up, and they didn't want her to to do a third one. Um, at the very least, they were cagey about any, any script ideas that she had, and so whatever treatment she submitted to them, they said, nope, this sucks. <laughs> and didn't, so, she, didn't she then link them the Wikipedia definition of a character she did. arc as well? I mean, that, that's the other aspect <laughs> of that, that sort of self-obsessed cult of genius is that she thinks she can do no wrong. She's got this fundamental grasp on the most basics of character writing and everyone else who disagrees with her idea about that is is just an idiot who doesn't know the first thing about writing and so she can send that incredibly patronizing thing which if i were to send that to any boss i'd ever had would probably have got me fired um so it used For to work, sure, at, yeah. Yeah, used to work at a newspaper if i'd sent my editor a wikipedia definition of how to edit articles because i disagreed with her decision i would not have expected to stay in that job 
I think but she was she, banking on her. She was gambling with her uh, leverage there, but I don't know why she believes she has much after eighty four. She, I think she's probably been made fun of it for quite a bit by different people, and she's probably like, "Fuck you, eighty four isn't bad." <laughs> what's, like, all right, what's, what's interesting as well is apparently her treatment for Wonder Woman three was going to have Steve Trevor come back again. For Christ's sake! Um, yeah, <laughs> using, <laughs> using a Batman device, which is the Lazarus pit. The Lazarus right? Yes. Yeah. And so, essentially, I think the, her idea almost was that the the trilogy was really about Steve Trevor rather than about Diana, which is just awful <laughs> as a concept. You're like, obsessed with Steve Trevor, both the character absurdly because she knew him for like a week, and it's been like decades. Dude, um, I don't know. I don't know if Patty first, Jenkins has just the, really got the fucking hots for for Chris Pine or what. And she just wants to fight any reason. She's had in her life, you know what I'm saying. You never so forget. He's, he's, yeah. the magi- he's the magical cock. That's what it is. <laughs> but but Chris Pine was the best thing about Wonder Woman. The uh, the well, irony yeah. of it of this this you know female led feminist ish movie was the fact that Chris Pine was the person who had the charisma, the personality uh, that <sighs> kind of drove things forward. I think he was the best thing about Wonder Woman in itself. I mean, I, I did. I liked Gal Gadot. Um, <laughs> because she's just beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> just, like, Listen, okay, I I appreciate a good looking woman like everybody else, but I, holy fuck, that woman cannot act. I'm sorry. She's she's weak. I mean, I I've said this to you more before. Like, I think they found the perfect character for her to play because it's essentially just Gal Gadot, like with a superhero outfit on. She's just really nice. She's very compassionate and and all the rest of it. Like, I get the feeling she's not acting all that much, but it's like, yeah. When you see her in other roles where she has to play a very different character, you can see her her lack of range there. It's it's not good. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think she was bad in that role. But yeah, clearly Chris Pine is the far more competent actor. I'm not going to deny that one. Um, I didn't I didn't feel like he was Steve Trevor was a character I desperately wanted to see again. If you know what I mean. So mm. no, I, I, no. But uh, yeah, I mean, especially you know, after the Patty, second one. Because the second one was about letting go. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then the second one's like, actually, let's not. Take your own but hint, Patty. The, but they set that movie so far into the future that it's like, how are you still not over this? Did you meet no other men ever? I know. It's not like she's hard on the eye. Like, uh, I'm sure she would, meet, she would meet lots of men <laughs> like in that time. <laughs> He hit the spot, Mola. He just hit the spot, you know. All right, fair enough. So it, it does make me wonder, like, uh, what the hell is Patty Jenkins going to do now? Because I don't think anyone at Warner Brothers is going to want to work with her again. She's not doing Cleopatra, as far as I know. Rogue Squadron, she claims it's it's happening, but then... Yeah, I was going to say, like, Rogue Squadron, uh, but then sure Lu- Lucasfilm is. is, like, the Schrodinger studio. Like, Lucasfilm will never outright say, this thing isn't happening. It's like Ryan Johnson's trilogy. It's simultaneously <laughs> it's happening, and it's not happening at the same time. And we'll never <laughs> yeah. find out which one it is. <laughs> A trilogy is this is fucking happening. It's definitely happening, okay? <laughs> definitely. It's like, what are you talking about, man? Like, Kathleen Kennedy might actually leave by the time it actually happens at this point. I, I think she's... Face. Who knows? Well, I mean, if... Uh, I, we'll get into this later in the stream, but yeah, if Indiana Jones 5 turns out the way we, we probably all imagine oh. it's gonna, then, <laughs> yeah, it, it's... She's out. <laughs> like, she can't possibly stay on after that. Like I, I'd love to see a good Rogue Squadron film. I, mean, I, I love those games. I actually re-downloaded them. The ones that are on Steam, I've got them now. And I, I haven't played like the N64 Rogue Squadron since I was like two, but they're really good fun. And you can do loads of stuff with with that. I just I don't really understand why Paddy Jenkins was the one chosen for that project to begin with. Um, but surely it's that's worth reviving. Was a pilot. Oh, the was father, he? I didn't know. Yeah. And, uh, I think it's, so, is, is it not is it not just flavor of the month situation as well? Like she did really good with Wonder Woman, and you know I guess Kathleen Kennedy is always on the lookout for another like talented female director that's up and coming that she can try and push, and so it just probably was a natural fit. Like of course, give her a Star Wars project. Oh, I, I, I just when you hear Star Wars, sorry, I just get PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> Star, uh, dude, Star Wars is in a really awkward and terrible position right now too. Like after Andor, like what are they? What, can you imagine the conversations they're having? Like, so that was supposed to be like one of the when we packed a lot of effort and time and uh, proper writing goals into, and people just didn't seem very fussed about it at all. So we, I saw a. We, I know, damning, and it's such a. Sorry, on you guys. Oh, I I saw a damning tweet the other day, and it would maybe kind of oof, and it said uh, Star Wars is. Now a TV franchise. 
It Pretty is. Pretty much, yeah. 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 Because they're they're not gonna risk another movie for quite some time. You know, these movies sorry, these T V shows are relatively cheap. In the case of like Book of Boba Fett, it's probably like <laughs> five fifty quid an episode Did you guys see, <laughs> roughly they're uh, spending. Apparently Tamura Morrison said it's probably time Boba Fett gets back to being ruthless now. Yeah. Like, cause even he's like, so yeah, that was shit. <laughs> like, yeah. He's like, always yeah, been, man. like, every time he gives an interview, I find myself saying, yeah, why aren't we listening? Why aren't the writers listening more to him? He just seems to have a better understanding of his character than anyone who's actually writing his character does these days. He doesn't have any, it doesn't have any pull, though, does he? It's not like he's an A-lister yeah, that not, can really yeah, command. I think the, the, the problem so even, with the, even, even the A-listers sorry. get ignored, right? Like, Luke, Luke uh, Mark Hamill, he had the famous amount of complaints about mischaracterizing Luke, and they didn't give a shit. Mm. Yeah, but then he's, you know, even him, he's not, he's not a major player in Hollywood, really. Like outside of Star Wars, like Mark Hamill's not not doing an awful lot these days. I would know? say it's rare to have major players in Hollywood who are uh, in it for like properly representing the characters and protecting characters. Like, those, I, yeah, those two I things mean, don't it, often line up, right? Like the influential and the ones invested in the artwork. It would be a situation of like I don't know. Say they made a, a Top Gun three, and it's like the director comes in, like someone like Ryan Johnson is like, so in this one, Maverick's going to be a fat, drunken loser who, yeah. who can't fly planes Tom anymore. Would stop and like, him. yeah, Tom would be like, that's not going to be happening, Ryan. You can you can get off my set now. Um, but yeah, yeah, not many actors have the ability to do that now. It's it's just the reality of the studio system. Yeah, no, you're right. Play. A lot of them, and I think even Mark Hamill said this about luke and like tlj it's just like you got to trust that they know what they're doing and you do what they tell you to do and then you know <laughs> and it's just like you hope basically that they know what they're doing because like yeah. you know we've had radical subversive moments in all time i imagine that those people when they were filming predator they were like is this goofy is this gonna work what is this nonsense like people want to see us blow th shit up they don't want to see us die do they you know, mm -hmm. there'd probably be plenty of questions about will it work, and then it comes out, and they're like, "Oh shit, that was amazing, actually, good stuff." I, I think, uh, yeah, I guess with filmmaking, like hindsight is always twenty twenty, and you can look back on all of these things and say, "Well, that that person was right; you should have trusted them or or the other person, whatever it might be." Uh, like you say, at the time when you're just feeling all this out and doing something that's not really been done before, it it, it is just like showing a bit of faith, I suppose, and you have to like. You have to hope that the person in charge of this thing or that thing really knows what they're doing and that they're going to produce something great. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But man, um, you'd think in some cases it would just be self-evident. Like in, you know, I guess in the case of something like TLJ, uh, surely people involved in that must have known this isn't going to work, man. We're on the, um, gonna... the fifth oh, anniversary Mark of that, aren't was we? Definitely one of them. <laughs> yeah, he was. Just on the Star Wars as TV point, though, uh, you that. That is true in the sense that, that that's where their most interesting content's coming out, well, it's where their content's coming out generally. That I don't think that's anything like a sustainable model. I mean, Star Wars has always been the film-led franchise. Even back in sort of the, the heyday when you had the old expanded universe, which was flourishing, that still flourishes off the back of a very, very successful cinematic run. The cinematic run is what gives it the inspiration. And then people who are very interested go to the sort of the nitty-gritty stuff, they go for the world-building stuff, they go for some of the deep lore stuff, and, and things that just wouldn't make it on the big screen. But you require... You need something to get people's attention to begin with before you generate that kind of fandom. Star Wars without films doesn't have that. It got rid of the old expanded universe. The only TV product it's got which is any way influential is The Mandalorian. And even that was dropping off quite quickly, I think, sort of throughout, throughout season two. Yeah. Andor, which is a very well-written show and it's a very intelligent show, is not the kind of thing that can sustain a franchise. It is it is one of those things you go to if you're interested in learning more, not the thing you go to if you're interested in coming to the thing to begin with. Um, that's one of the reasons I don't think many people watched it, precisely because there hasn't been a great successful cinematic run recently. If there had been, Andor would have been much better received by the general audience. Oh, Until think... they've got the, the studio, the, the film side down, which they show no signs of doing, it's they're on a losing run, I think, even if they do increase writing quality as with Andor. Well, you've also oh, got the, the shows are scattered all over the place as well. You know, you've got things like Andor that are set before the rebellion begins or, you know, just chronicling the start of that. But then you've got things mm. like Boba Fett and, um, and Mandalorian, which are set, you know, in the wake of, of Return mm. of the Jedi. And it's just like you're all over the place with it. There's no there's no coherency there either. And, you know, like you say... If, say, they'd, they'd done this new trilogy of movies, the sequel trilogy, and it'd been massively successful, you could have had a whole bunch of TV shows in and around that time period. No one gives a shit about that, so they're having to turn their, their 
eyes back to like earlier, more popular periods in Star Wars history, including the prequels. But, but why yeah. give? Yeah. Why put out a, a, a product like Andor on a which is a a prequel to a prequel, which is about a character that died in his original film. Yeah, and you a character know, that no one remembers. Yeah, yeah, he was a non-entity in Rogue One. You know, he wasn't particularly an entity in Rogue One. And now you're saying we're going to do a whole series about how he got yeah. in, how he how he got to the point where he died. So I think, and, yeah. Why, yeah. Well, I, I see. I see that criticism. So there is a justifiable and, and well-worn trope of like the blank narrator, um, all throughout English fiction. Even in War was was very good at this. If you read any Evelyn War novel, like Brideshead Revisited in particular, which is a first-person novel, the character with the least personality and character to his name, and the least agency in terms of what happens in the plot, is the protagonist because he's a vehicle for the audience to see the world around him, the characters around him, the relationships that are forming that are not his own. Now. I, I would have preferred a more active protagonist than Cassian Andor, um, but th there is utility in having a, a character whose fate you already know. I mean, the Star Wars prequels, we already know the fate of every character involved in those. It's not an essential problem to say that, well, we already know what happens to Andor. Um, it did allow it to do a lot of world building well, stuff I don't think it could have done otherwise. I, th but... I think what's being highlighted there isn't that the story can't be uh, intriguing, meaningful, blah, blah, blah. It's I assume what as is going for is what I would go for is like, Really, you're putting your eggs in this basket, like yeah. This what's is what you're the gonna hook? Use. Remember I, I the, think the, the it could be the they, best made show. Sorry, the card, they, uh, the card they played that I think had the most power was we're bringing back Ewan McGregor and uh, Hayden Christensen to play mm -hmm. the characters both post uh, prequels and during <sighs> prequels. We're doing that. It's like holy shit. Do you understand? You're gonna grasp all of the prequel fans, which there are hordes of passionate ones. All the people who are currently into Star Wars are just like, oh yeah, that'll be cool. And then the OT fans would be like, hey, you doing you doing something that runs up to to a new mm -hmm. hope, and you're going to possibly set like some wheel building stuff. So, yeah, yeah. And you've got Ewan McGregor, who everybody is happy to basically age into playing the role mm. of Obi Wan as Alec Guinness at this point. Like, there's there's no question. And what did you do with that show? It's like that's possibly one of the most <laughs> lazy and just like backward ass things. It it had it was competition to Boba Fett. How the hell did you make it so bad? Why did you pack all of the effort into Andor? Yeah. yeah. What are you doing? It's just the hook. Obi-Wan was the hook. You could have gotten so much more success if you'd given a shit about it. Mm -hmm. I think the, the part of the problem was that Andor was made before everything else, but it was delayed for yes. ages. And so this this almost represents like a different era of Star Wars TV shows. And like if they if the rest of them had been made with this level of care and this like uh, this style my God, some of them could have been incredible. Like, imagine the Mandalorian made in the style of Andor with that level of, of gritty realism. Mm. Um, that could have been something fantastic. Yeah, maybe he'd have a character. That'd be neat. But yeah, like, I, I agree. Like, um, Andor, it's not so much the fact that we know his fate. It's the fact that he just wasn't a very interesting character to begin with. And so getting people to buy into him and want to know more about him is always going to be a struggle because he's just not that... Compelling. That's what I'm saying. Like dragging people into seeing that, it's hard to even tempt friends of mine. It's like, why should I see Andor? It's that guy from that thing. I don't even remember. Meanwhile, like, how easy is it to sell a Star Wars fan on the Obi Wan Kenobi show? It's like, <laughs> if you're invested in Star Wars for any reason, the Obi Wan Kenobi show is going to have something that'll hook you by premise, and you'll watch it and be like, "What the fuck was that?" Yep. It, it was weird. Like reviewing Andor, I was in this weird position where it's like I'm praising a Disney Star Wars TV show, which I didn't think I would ever do. But yeah. I'm doing it for the most obscure character that I don't care about in the slightest. So but it's the Rogue it's like, One dynamic again, right? I mean, Rogue One is the best of the Disney Star Wars films, and it's the one that nobody asked for, nobody expected, and that we didn't, technically speaking, need because it doesn't add anything to the story that we we don't already know the conclusion of. Yeah. But by virtue of it being out of the way, unexpected, and probably not paid a huge amount of attention to by the studio itself, it became reasonably good on its own terms, certainly compared to what comes after it. We well, became this movie that we all just kind of yeah. It's like one of those movies that we just kind of don't even talk about anymore. It's like you know we, we talk about oh the Disney Star Wars movies were shit, and then someone in the room will say yeah, but Rogue One was okay, and then everyone sort of goes yeah, oh yeah. Okay. Most people yeah. say well that the third act, the third act was alright. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, and then then the conversation moves on, and it's just like this forgotten movie that no one's like particularly like hates or loves. It's just there. Um, but I guess, you know, maybe in Disney Star Wars terms, like, not hating it is a win. <laughs> you know? but with, with Rogue One, though, I've seen Rogue One once. 
Yeah. It's the only Disney Star that's Wars show that I've, I've willingly watched more than once. I think I've seen them all more than once, but that's the only one that I've occasionally gone back to just because I fancied rewatching it. The movie now we're talking about, yeah? Yeah. Because obviously I was going to say, I've seen them multiple times for work, as, but like for enjoyment, I would never watch any of them. Like, that's not happening. Maybe I've watched Rogue One out of curiosity. I haven't seen that one in a while now, so I don't even know exactly how I feel about it. But if we were talking about the shows, though, yeah, like none of those would be watched for enjoyment. Uh, though mm -hmm. Andor, maybe I, I'm, I'm still yet to catch up on it. I'm going to get Rags and Fringy. We're going to try and go through it soon because uh, everyone's everyone's talking about how they're, they're pissed that that's like the one Star Wars show we miss. And it's like, look, I'm sorry. Lots of stuff. Is happening. I, I think at the very least, you'll have some interesting conversations to have about it. Like even when we, I think the three of us had watched like the first two or three episodes and rather than us just sitting there and saying like, oh God, it was such a ridiculous disaster. Like, can you believe they wrote this? It was more like, yeah, we can, we can actually like pick apart some of the characters' motivations and where this could be leading. And it was like, yeah, there's, there's there's things to enjoy about it, I suppose. There's things to speculate on, which, you know. Well, I mean, you know, you... It's better you, than most. You gave a pretty strong recommendation in your video, right? So I, uh, I have... Uh, and I keep hearing people say, like, oh, you got to see Andy Serkis in it. Those episodes are really, really good. And it's like, all right, mm -hmm. all right. To be fair, I also gave you a strong recommendation to watch Willow, and you did. <laughs> <laughs> Not for the same reasons, though. <laughs> Absolute pain. <laughs> I, I don't know about you guys. I, I genuinely think that's a candidate for the worst thing I've seen this year. Uh, I, I, think I, it might be, I think it might be worse than She-Hulk. Dude, when you, when you had told me to watch it, and, and when I booted up, I was like, oh, this will be awkward if I watch all four episodes and I don't have much to say. Like, I, I worry about stuff like that sometimes. It's like, I just come in here, I'm just like, oh, yeah, it was, you know, it was fine. I fucking hate it, and I have many issues with it as soon as it started. I Like, I got a huge sense of it being incredibly cheap and, like, wannabe fantasy that, like, someone really badly photocopied a basic starter book on how to do fantasy. I got, like, so many indications straight away that they were just like, this is how you do it, right? You have like like the music, the sets, the costume. The costumes are so horribly simplistic and like mm. out of order. I wonder if Shad's done some form of a breakdown on that. I'd have to imagine he did. There are some um, peculiar looking swords in there that I'm thinking you'd have some good fun with. Willow, oh. Willow is like, it's unironically one of my favorite things on TV at the moment though, because <laughs> it's it's got all the horror of a horror and it's got all the comedy <laughs> of a comedy and it's not aware of any of it. I mean, it's so, <laughs> un it doesn't know what it's doing. It doesn't, so, it doesn't think it has a reason to exist. It's just there. Warwick Davis, how many takes did it take to get him to deliver his lines with a complete, perfect absence of personality? I, I, mean, it's, I was, it's really I was something. baffled. I honestly, the I only way bad. I could rationalize it was like he walked onto set, didn't know his lines or anything, and he just had a teleprompter to read off. Okay. And like he's just looking at it and reading, and he has no clue what the context is. I need to get well. So f first of all, some context, right? I got through most of episode one, but something in it happened that was so bafflingly fucking stupid to me that I asked Rags to start watching it with me, and he did. Um, the poor guy made it through with me. He helped me out. Uh, I, I've got to be honest. He's my he's my support animal. Okay, I, I need help sometimes. But um, with Roy Davis, like both of us were like immediately like, holy shit! The lines he's delivering. What the hell is going on? Like he's doing them so badly. And I had a question. I don't know if you guys can help me answer this. I was like, oh wait, is he a good actor, or have I just invented that in my head? Was he ever a good actor? Uh, I mean, in the original Willow, I feel like he was okay. Like. He actually, you know, he put inflection into his voice. He put emotion into it. He was trying to do things. But it's almost like, he, I don't know, maybe he's just been retired from acting for a while and he's just lost the knack for it. Or he, he just he did say didn't care he was, about this one. He said he was trying to channel <clears throat> Mark Hamill's turn as Jake Skywalker in The Last Jedi, which what I think does shows. That mean? <laughs> well, I, I'd imagine that the fact that he so evidently doesn't give a shit is him actually <laughs> taking inspiration yeah. from a character who doesn't give a shit at all. It, it's really something. Every scene in that show is just I, I'm, I'm either giggling or I'm cowering behind my hands. It, it's really, it's really something. I'm really enjoying it, but for all the I, wrong I, I, reasons. Well, I think you know, Moa, you were texting me as you were watching it, and you were like saying to me, it like the characters all talk like they're in Starbucks in LA it's or something, and it's absolutely just... losing my. Shit shit trying to okay i want to go on a little bit of a rant here there was this one okay. for anybody who hasn't seen the show this is i'm, I'm doing this for you because the, the drinker and some others will know how this ends i was watching it and i was like i kind of hate every character but they have the guy i forget his name this guy with super deep voice from some other things he's like an actual actor he was in the witch he was in some other stuff 
but he he talks like this. He's got like super deep voice. He's, he's in Game um, of Thrones as well, wasn't he? Oh, uh, you mean Finchy from The Office? That yes, I think so. Yeah, he was also oh, in Game of Thrones. Yeah, I, think. I know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I really like it when he shows up because that voice is just glorious to listen to. Um, I think he was in The Green Knight as well. He's in a couple of things, but when I saw him, I was like, okay, cool. He's uh, he was he was like, I'm the knight of the whatever gods, and I was like, cool. Yeah. And then there was another guy who's like older, and he was like, I'm also I'm the the leader or the veteran member or something. I was like, these two, they both talked at least slightly closer to era or authenticity than than yeah. um, every other fucking character couldn't resist just being like. Oh my god, like, how are we doing today? I was like, oh, I find yeah. everything so fr- oh, I can't believe we're doing this today. Just like, oh dear. Like, like everyone's talking like that. Meanwhile, you, you cut to, like, one of those characters who are like, my lady, how are you today? Like, if we reach the gate before nightfall, it's like, you can't have dialogue like that. And then, oh, I really wish things would go a little faster around here. The princess. Like, the princess he, has her drunken rant where she says, like, 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 every other, yes. like, word, like, like, and so... You, you you have just been you're not even acting this is just you in your acting school in california somewhere that's what you sound like and you sound exactly the same as any other person in the show with the odd notable exception but like the scullery maid who turns out to be the very important one who comes from a really we're a oh drinker we were on mr brown alliance a couple of days ago ranting mm. about this as well but like, these are there's a princess and a maid these two characters should not sound the same at all because there's so much world building you don't actually state you depict by the way people speak and the way they interact if one is, if someone is a maid they should be probably more plain spoken but also subservient to the high spoken high status individual like a princess if they you're i just did like it's catching if you're um princess and your scuttery maid speak in the same way and in their first scene together outside the castle they just argue with each other as though they're complete social equals and they're equivalently bratty like i, I don't understand how anything in this world works or how anyone thought that this was a good idea when they put it on the screen it was almost i, I don't plot i don't understand how because this is all happening with the, the the kingdom that they all take part in that they're all members of is like a, a relatively constrained geographical area and yet you've got this weird like you say more this mixture of like kind of theatrical um you know fantasy generic english you know um, yeah. dialects and like weird 21st century american like how are those two things combined together into the same area like how do some people have such radically different accents and i can't pin it down to anything more than the actors either couldn't be bothered or didn't have the ability to do accents and so they just rolled with it with whatever they had because no one cared it was, uh, that, it was. I was losing my mind. I was just about to mention, like what uh, Lord Platoon just brought up is. It almost works as a plot point, and if you remember Game of Thrones season two, like Tywin notices that Arya as a cupbearer is speaking too well, like, and he's yes. like, "How is it you've gotten to that point?" It's like, "Did your father?" And she's like, "My father taught me to speak better, uh, proper." And then she was pro properly, and then he's like, "Okay." When obviously the truth is that she is highborn, um, but like, yeah, like t that attention to detail, nowhere near happening in this show, and. What I wanted to get to basically was that it started making me hate everyone who speaks, you know, the, the like modernism sort of stuff. But the the two dudes who were like trying to somewhat come across as though they're actually in a fucking fantasy thing, I was like, I guess I kind of like it when these guys show up. And when they created their little fellowship, I was just like, at least at least old soldier dude is here, <laughs> I, I guess. And you know exactly where I'm going with this. <laughs> yep. uh, they were, so they were they were making their way, and, and as I'm gonna, I want to see your face when I describe this event. Okay. You got your entire cast of absolute cunts, and then old dude who's kind of chill. He's kind of all right. He's like your little Barristan Selmy, uh, or, or not necessarily, but kind of an equivalent. Old dude who's a soldier who's there to protect them and keep them together. He says he's he's partly very invested in this mission because he wants to go and save the prince who's been kidnapped because he was there when he was born, and he feels that he's kind of a father figure to him, okay? He's like important. And this guy apparently is such a veteran. All of these people likely would have known him their whole lives. And they're having this stupid fucking argument, and he cuts through it and says, "Like we need to band together. We need to keep together. We, we got to stop arguing, stop fighting. The prince is relying on us. These play this this whole area is dangerous. At any moment, we could be ki and then he gets shot in the heart by an arrow. And that's him dead. And, and, and that's but it's, it. it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there because there's, there's a reason why I drag rags on. I had to show him this scene. So I was so fucking blown away. He falls off his horse, and like the rest of them sort of have shocked faces. And then this this series of like you know." raiders start coming at them like Rawr! and then uh one of them is like oh dear like i'm not on a horse the other one goes oh fine you can come on mine and she does and then it plays like heroic adventure music as they're escaping 
they never mention the guy the died. died. Oh, they right. never mention it. <laughs> so his body's just left unburied to rot away and get eaten by There's animals. This shot. He's not he's not a randomer either, right? So he volunteered no, he's to go on the <laughs> no. mission. He's an important character in their backstory. Also, he wasn't originally going to go. It was the Game of Thrones guy who was going to go, but he said, no, you can't go. I need to go. This is sort of my mission. So he's billed up as this old, wise man who has actually got a bit of a personality he's and a character a relationship with all of the important people. He's killed... And they never mention it. So oh, they dude, ride it's... off. They ride horses off a cliff and survive for reasons. I and still then... don't understand that scene, by the way. I know, like, I that, know they, they fall like a good 50 feet and they land in shallow water and everyone's fine. And then, well, like, they just wander off. And then in the next scene... Should your horses scene, be broken? <laughs> in the next scene, the, the queen, princess and the wannabe, well, the, the soon-to-be-married person, they're just you know chatting about their relationships. So, so the script that I'd written for it, which I never got around to doing a video for, I just sort of done a tally. Like, how long has it been since they mentioned the fact that the old guys died? They never mentioned like, it. Never mentioned it <laughs> at all. Well, so it gets better than that, right? Because you just described that absolutely insane horse action scene that didn't make any sense at all. <laughs> when a character dies, and it's at the beginning of an action scene, it's a shock. I can understand characters not being able to grieve until that scene is done and they get a second to breathe. So your action scene ends and then it cuts and as Lil Platoon was just describing it it like zooms into the the main girl main guy and they're talking and she said she like looks sad and I think me and Rags were like so now they're going to talk about it surely and she's like sorry for how I was mean to you earlier and he's like it's okay <laughs> and we, were, and we were literally like what the fuck is happening he just died he just died in front of you and nobody cares was this was this the show trying to make a point about like mansplaining because like know. he was, because he was like an old white dude who was like trying to caution them about the dangers of the world and like trying to explain things to the youngins and he just he gets killed for it that's like his punishment and then everyone's almost like ha ha what a fool but off we go from what i can gather what he was explaining happened so yes. he was right I don't he know was absolutely right, yeah, but it's like joke. so many so many serious <sighs> things that should be horrific or should be moving or poignant are just played for laughs in this show yeah. because it it's a show which is it's like it's so aware of how shit it is that it's literally taking the piss out of itself as it goes. Dude, you know, knew, almost like, well, you can't moment. make fun of me because I've already made fun of myself, sir. Like, I knew from that moment, I was like, so this isn't going to be the kind of show where I'm like, eh, it's meh. This, was, this is a special kind of horrifically bad that I have no idea how they managed to make it. Because uh, <laughs> as it does, it doesn't, the, the, a point of comparison, I think it's episode two or three, but uh, Lady is running through Spooky Forest. I've already skipped over so much dumb shit for how this gets to this point, but fuck it. Running through Spooky Forest, being chased by three men on horseback. Then they are meters away from her. And then she she's running just like scary. It's kind of like a Snow White sort of with with how they film it. They're like rocky camera. There's like screamy noises, all dark. And then she just enters this really brightly lit, chill, serene, colorful area with two lesbian lumberjacks that are dressed in <laughs> denim clothing. That that's with literally like, what they are. With like modern hats on. Rags notice this. They've got like um, the little uh, metal hoops in hats that looks like mm -hmm. absolutely would be out of era completely. Well, they're literally wearing jeans and, and denim shirts. That's really... Is, I thought, right, my immediate thought was like, oh, it's like an illusion. It's like an evil witch lives in this forest, and this is an illusion, and she's being... Because it started all spooky, and now it's like suddenly happy. It's like, I don't think so. Or they're going to turn out to be cannibals or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I thought it was going to go that direction. No, turns out they are just really kind lesbian lumberjacks who serve the queen as soon as they find out it's her. And then when the soldiermen turn up, they both get killed, and it's very sad. I absolutely that's, had no that's fucking it, that's clue. Literally it. Seriously, you could never have described that to me and I would have believed you. I'd be like, no, no. And uh, me and Rags were trying to figure out what the fuck the point of all of that was. Can I, can I say as well, that you notice that they're also vegetarians because they, they're just roasting like vegetables and mushrooms on kebab skewers. <laughs> And they, when when the first one gets killed, the ca it's like tragic music plays. The camera shows her on the ground with blood on her mouth. She's dead. And I was like, how did this random fucking lumber Jane get more attention than the veteran hero soldier man who died protecting everybody who was there to save them? Oh, yeah. What the can, fuck can is I, happening? Can I also point out that. she she actually bests a trained knight, like the most elite fighting man of the of the realm. Because she slams a fucking axe right into his spine, and it's only because he's been possessed by this weird demon thing that it doesn't kill him. Like, if he'd been a normal human, he would have been stone dead at that point. And she's she's not a soldier or anything, she's just got the power of lesbian lumberjackness to, about her. Oh. To, to, 
I'll love to defeat him. I love that fucking baffling scene. I I do not know what this show is. Like after watching those four episodes, I was so fucking confused with all of it. Looking back, it's, it's just like thinking. Show. But the, the, it's also it does that very unwise thing where the, every other line is supposedly comedic. Like you have characters quipping with each other. They're the kind of jokes that make MCU Phase 4 look like they were written by John Cleese. I mean, they are so bad. <laughs> but then occasionally, so there's the scene when Willow takes Princess, whatever her name is, down to his little people cave. And then he, he tells a joke which is not going to land. And the point of the joke is that it doesn't land with the audience. So he turns around yeah. and says, that's supposed to be funny. Well, okay, but, but every one of your actual jokes does exactly the same thing. Like, that's the same caliber as the jokes that the writers think are actually funny. There's no differentiation between those at all. Uh, I, and then I, I was trying to think, like, what is the point of this show? There's a bit in episode four where you sort of think, well, what maybe what they're trying to do, and I use the word trying advisedly, is recapture that slightly jaunty, slightly silly style of comedy that you saw in so well in the time period that the original Willow came out. And, you know, reaches its sort of epitome in Indiana Jones, which is, you know, it's a lighthearted, it's not an especially serious adventure style romp with comedic moments in it. And it's a little bit silly, but everyone forgives its silliness because it's in basically good faith. Um, but I don't think it's doing that enough, really, or that they have it in mind at all, except for the I, occasional scene. I think it's just I, terrible. I was, I was wondering about this. I was looking back on the, the, the original movie and thinking, okay, was it just a complete farce? Was the, the original movie just a big old joke and like this is just emulating that style but i look back on it and it's like well yeah it did have kind of goofy scenes occasionally but like it also knew when to pull it back and have it become quite serious like so that you could actually get invested in it like there were stakes you know people could die it, it was serious at times and so I, I can't even rationalize what they're trying to do with this show it's like, well, like you say, it, it feels like it doesn't really have a purpose for existing. It doesn't know what it's trying to be, what it's trying to do. It's like the makers of it have never seen a fantasy show in their lives. They don't know how they're, they're meant to frame any of this. And so all they can do is just like pour modern terminology, modern dialogue and everything into this weird fantasy setting. And you throw in random sort of fantasy sounding words. So there's, there's that South Park episode where... Um... They have to take the the porn film back to the the uh, the video store, whatever it is. And um, there's a clip of of Randy watching the Lord of the Rings or a spoof version of the Lord of the Rings. And the dialogue is like, in the far flung regions of blah blah blah, blah you you have the the great sword of blaggle blag is that that's Willow's scene setting dialogue. It just sounds like a South Park parody. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. When it's coming to its actual dialogue, it is just yeah modern day California. And then when it comes to it, because even its tone is all over the place, because there's so many set pieces that you think, okay, so this is made for kids, right? But then there's so many lines in the dialogue which just don't work for kids. So there's a reference to the sort of the dashing young prince hunting for women. Willow says he, get, he goes on the piss. There's a joke about making genital wind smell like pomegranate or something. It's like, that's, that's not really kid-friendly stuff. So I don't know what your target audience is for this because you're treating the audience like children but you're giving them references that are probably too mature for children so, so who are you who are you trying to please with this you also, know as well like i liked as well when movies used to build up romantic relationships and you know have it be a bit of will they won't they and you know you get to see characters gradually fall for each other and you you understand you know why they get together ultimately like there's attraction there there's things in common you know the personalities spark off each other in certain ways uh, i love how willow just immediately launches in and they really need to hammer home within the first five minutes like the you know kit and and ginger jesus are super gay for each other like there's no doubt there you have to get that in straight away and it has to be uh established in the audience's mind and it's like i don't know why i care about their relationship i don't know why i'm supposed to care uh, about the fact that they've fallen out with each other and you know they uh, they're a bit estranged from each other why should I care? Because I don't know anything about either of them. And so I've never had the chance to see their relationship develop. You've just plonked it on me and expected me to care about this thing. It doesn't I mean, make any sense. They do those occasional short bursts of so on your nose exposition that your nose ends up bleeding. So when the first argument between Princess and, and the dashing young Prince guy, um, 
when the princess he's taken the princess away when she was giving her drunk Californian rants and then she says something like because we know nothing about these characters so she says every time anybody asks anything of you you just run away like our father oh, oh god oh, oh thank yeah. you for that thank oh, you so much oh it was much. so painful so painful you know what Dude. I loved as well um, you know Bab Mordo the, the, the evil witch from the first movie yeah. Uh, so we had to get backstory from her, and we find out because no woman is ever evil. Apparently, like they all start out nice, and it's only someone else who corrupts them. And so she was, they they use this word as well. She was radicalized by the the, the, the six, this the the gods six of the six, or something something yeah. dumb like that. Yeah. Uh, so she was a nice person to begin with, then she was taken in, and she was radicalized. Uh, and Donna uh, organized. Yes. Uh, I'm sure they they operate on the internet as well. Those six bloods, whatever medieval equivalent. Yeah. yeah. Um, um. That 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 around that area, by the way, for for dialogue, just driving me nuts. Was um, she makes a big old scene, the little, little princess lady, because she doesn't want to get married or whatever, and then she's like getting chewed out by the mum, and the prince guy comes in. And he's like, okay, it's all right. I've spoken to a few people. I've talked to the the prince's dad, the king, or whatever. Like, uh, it looks like things are getting smoothed over. People understand. It was it wasn't like a huge thing. It's fine. I rem I remember watching it and being like, oh, you know, that's that's there you go. He he sorted that out. And the mum just looks at him and goes, why don't you just fucking shut up and get out of here? You useless. You don't make anything better. You have no idea what you're doing. I I legit was just like, I'm sorry. Did I miss dialogue? <laughs> <laughs> What just happened? He just said he made things categorically better, and she just bites his head off. I was like, I get it, she's in a bad mood or whatever. I was just like, wow, I don't like anybody here. Like, you're all just ass. Dude, Kit? Oh, she's trying my patience. She's competing with Gladriel and fucking, uh, oh, who is she, Hulk? Like, really wants me to hate her. Um, that, that's the thing. Like, I, with, with these other characters, Galadriel, the hatred towards her was like a slow build. Like, But with Kit, it was like within the first 10 minutes of her being on screen, I, I fucking hated her. She's a um, twat she's, to everyone. Yeah, exactly. She's immediately established as a horrible person. She treats everyone around her like shit. She's arrogant. She's self-absorbed. She's, she's just out for herself. Why am I supposed to like her? And... You know, the argument that people will make is like, well, she's meant to be a flawed character and eventually she'll learn, you know, to have a bit of humility and mature. But it's like, okay, fine, but you have to at least give her some kind of kernel of a, of goodness inside her. You know, you have to give her something that we can latch onto and like about her. But, like, they have done nothing like that. She has, She is literally a horrible person. There's no reason to like her. And so there, there's, no, there's no seed of, of goodness that can grow in her. Like, she's just an, an asshole. Wait, all we got is she doesn't want to be married to the guy. She wants to go out and do stuff. It's like, yeah. okay, what else you got? And it's like, I don't know. She's an asshole. Literally yeah. everybody who ever tries to talk to her or suggest anything to her, she, like, shoots down and makes fun of. And then sometimes she'll find out she was wrong and just be like, well, okay, whatever. What was she's the... Like, what right. was the... <laughs> I was going to ask as well, what was the point in the horse and cart? Because, <laughs> like... <laughs> If you're in pursuit of people that have been kidnapped, like probably the worst vehicle you could use for pursuit is like a really heavy, slow moving cart that you have to be hauled around in and it gets stuck in everything. It Dude, gets stuck the... in the mud, the wheel falls off. And then it's like they get to a certain point and it just gets struck by lightning and it explodes. <laughs> I, uh, what the is logistics, this? The logistics of pulling and pushing around everybody or where they were, like it just cuts to them all surrounding a wheel and looking at it and. Oh man, it drove Rags insane. They're holding the wheel. One of them goes, "Is it broken?" And apparently, they can't figure that out. And Rags is like, "It's a wheel." It should be pretty simple to figure <laughs> you out. You can kind of tell broken. by looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then, and then it like cuts to them later. They're all like on the floor, exhausted. It's like we got the wheel back on. It's like so. So it wasn't broken. So what happened? Just fell off. What? What is this? It's like it just delay the characters. We had to delay them. That's all. Again, it, it's like the mindset of like what they should be looking at is a car engine that's got some complex mechanical problem yes. there. It's like, well, only one guy can fix it because he's the he's the, the mechanic. But it's like, yeah, like you say, it's a fucking wheel. It's like any person can look at it and tell if it's broken or not. Like it doesn't take a, a genius mind to fix this thing. There's the other uh, wagon bit as well. And I might have misseen this because it just makes so little sense. But actually, it's Willow, so of course it doesn't. But during the fight scene when they, they've got the wagon to the place where they're having the fight with all the, the evil people and willow's plan is that he has something in the wagon that he can use against the the not orcs mm -hmm. and so he says well we need to get everyone to the wagon so i can use it 
and then the wagon explodes because the wagon is full of high explosives. And, and, and I was thinking, well, that's, that's like the, strike, yeah. the, le- the last place I would want to gather all of my forces is on top of the bomb that I was going to throw at my enemy. It just doesn't make any well, sense. It's funny you bring that up because that was another tonal thing for me, right? Because he's he basically spends the whole fight pussying out in the background, not doing anything. And then you find out it's like, no, it's because I have a plan. Everyone stop fighting and get to the wagon. And then it shows <laughs> the wagon it explodes. And he goes, OK, actually, keep fighting. Like, it's like, haha, pay off, joke, haha. And then next, like, two minutes is his friend gets killed. And he's like, no. And I was just like, oh, I guess it's not funny anymore. <laughs> like, yeah, but, that, that was serious, I guess. That that's yeah, that's the problem, isn't it? It's like it makes jokes and it takes the piss out of itself all throughout it, and then expects you get to get invested in these sudden, like, dramatic moments that are meant to be super serious and, and emotional. Like, you can't do that. You can't have it both ways. If this is how you're going to frame your show, well, it is. And I like that well, guy like, as well. He was I, actually I, a good dude, actor. Uh, every time me and Rags were like, oh, I kind of like this person. It's like, they're dead. It's like, oh, fuck. And that happened three <laughs> times in the four episodes. But yeah, he yeah, was the, 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 the little, the guy with the shivs, right? Like, just, yeah. I love like the idea that he's actually making a difference and hitting hit people. But then he just gets thrown and he sort of lands against a wall. And it's just like, he's dead now. You're like, is he? Okay. <laughs> I guess he's out then. Bye. Willow, you can use your magic to save me. No, I don't want to waste my magic. Oh, well, that was a, a bit... really shite excuse for him to not be casting spells. You are a bit crap then, if, if that's how Dude, limited you are um, in power. I'll go as far as saying that Willow has, has been made a shit character in this. He's like an idiot asshole who can't use his abilities, and whenever he does, he does it belligerently and hates everybody. Like He's, he's not fun to watch as a character in this. He's really not, and also he's mostly just there to move the plot along. So the number of times you'll get an equivalent of they're walking and then they're arguing about being lost. Someone will say, we have no idea where we are, and Willow will say, I do. And then pan out shot and they're in an incredibly important place. So the number of times like something equivalent to that happens in this show, he is just there for, well, we've, we've done our bickering, now we need to move somewhere. So let's just have Willow say, this is where we are now. And then we're there, magic. And it... Oh dear. But, but like so much of his dialogue is like we can't go to this place. You know, we can't do that. We can't do this because it's too dangerous. And it's like they do it anyway and then and everything pretty much turns out fine anyway. It's like you, you can't just have a character whose only thing is to just say, well, we can't do this and we can't do that, but then not offer any alternative suggestions. <laughs> it's like <clears throat> if you listen to Willow, you wouldn't go anywhere or do anything. It's the Luke Skywalker effect from TLJ. It's just like, you know, just Leave my island. Oh, don't try and fix things. Don't try and take on the enemies. Just, just well, yeah, give up. Be like he's, me. He's watching his entire like fellowship equivalent being attacked by these people who are trained. Some of them trained the people they're fighting, so they are way better. And he's just like, guess I'll wait until one of you dies before I cast a spell. It's just like this is <laughs> shit. Like, uh, what an asshole. And it's the same when they're like, oh, you've been infected. That sucks. We're gonna chain you up and we'll kill you once you are a threat to us. And then someone's like, is there no way we can save him? But Willow's like, there may be one way. It's like, what and the it's, fuck? What the and fuck? It, like, and it's, <laughs> wouldn't you know it? Like, they're, they happen to be in the one place that has a book which can tell them what to do and also has all of the medical supplies that they need to make the thing that the book tells them to make. I was <laughs> it's like, wow. driven fucking mad when you have him being, like, scolded and he's, he's screaming in pain, sweating, and, and talking about his, like, his life and what it meant and hallucinating his father abusing him while all the other characters, one of them is literally walking around making jokes about how he's drunk. The other two women are just like sitting in a hallway talking about their feelings while Willow just disappears at one point. I was just like, nobody cares about this guy who like, he's injured because he tried to save someone's life. I hate I fucking hate it when they do that. That like, entire it, scene was just nonsensical. So yeah, like you say, so he's infected. They chain him up, and then time passes, and you know time's passed because they do a lot of sort of cuts to, to indicate time passing. Um, and he's still tied up, and he's getting worse and worse and worse. And then only after presumed hours have passed does someone say, "How long does he have?" <laughs> and then we're yeah. like, "Well, he'll transform in the early hours, probably." So princess as well. The kind thing to do is kill him. Well, would you not have reached that conclusion? A long time ago. Well, why have you just left him chained up and suffering if you all knew that that was what you had to do? Except that then, at the very end, someone says, 
hey, maybe maybe it's worth trying to save him somehow. And they say, oh, yeah, maybe maybe that's a good idea as well. <laughs> I, can't, I can't fucking believe that shit. And it's so unbelievable to me as well that we have, like, they crack the code on saving people from that infection at, near the end of the episode. And it's just like, man, if only you'd, like, thought to try and figure this out a little earlier, you might have been able to save the fucking captain of the guard. He just had to get killed because you guys suck. Yep. And it's so like, annoying. yeah, it's one of the few actors who's actually halfway decent and seems to care about what he's doing. <laughs> Like, that's what God. i mean man like like what have we got left we had the veteran soldier man where i was like at least i got him he dies and then we had okay at least i got a guy who's like a good actor and has an interesting voice he's dead and i was like okay at least i have the little guy with the shivs he's kind of he's dead it's like ah uh, like... <laughs> the the big guy's hey. next by the way because he's halfway like tolerable like they're gonna kill him you still got the his... lesbian so that's okay no they, they are exactly they are bulletproof too. in this they are never oh, yeah. gonna die those lesbians were, but the lesbian lumberjacks went down straight oh. away. Dude, I laughed my fucking ass off when she's running with the remaining lesbian and they bump into a soldier and then they she like the girl looks like she's gonna stand her ground or something, and then the other lesbian she just immediately sprints in the other direction. She's just like, bye, like I'm out, I'm on to <laughs> And then um, it looks like she's gonna make it, and then uh the princess blonde girl whatever the fuck she is she's like please take me and spare her like pointing at a girl that's already like a mile away running <laughs> but then another soldier cuts her off and just kills it <laughs> me and Rags just bursts out laughing like we can't let any lesbians get away <laughs> they, kill the they might <laughs> spread we can't let them get the message out or whatever what was that whole sequence dude what was that <laughs> It, it was. I, I can't even. Yeah, I can't. All even. of this is why Willow is my favorite thing on TV at the moment. <laughs> I mean, it's it's going to give you fuel for like a thousand videos because honestly, like this this could be picked apart <laughs> ad infinitum. Just, like, you know, I said to Rags at one point, I was like, "Do you remember Lord of the Rings? Do you remember when like that could have been considered by a crazy person to just be okay?" Yeah. Well. On the plus side, more we had Rings of Power, and no. things are going to get even better in Rings of Power season two because apparently they've hired an all-female directing team. Um, okay, I don't understand why this. Why was this a headline? What is this even supposed to mean? <laughs> like, what are we supposed to take from that? Are they trying to tell us like, be reassured, it was the men that ruined the first season? The I women know, are here now. For for a minute there, I was worried it was going to be bad, but now I'm reassured everything <laughs> will be know, fine. Be great. But the thing is, the the problem. Well, there was the the directing wasn't good in season one anyway. But like the the problem was the writing. Like if you don't change your entire writing team, nothing's going to get fixed. I think the writing and the acting. I don't think the acting was particularly great. Well, yeah, that's it. Yeah, the special so you, effects you, were a bit shitty in places. So basically, the, 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 the whole show was, was terrible. Yeah. yeah, the casting was appalling. The acting was. Very what? mid. The I script was, was absolutely it. abysmal. The special effects were pathetic in most of it. Um, yeah, the whole show was already disastrous. Like, oh, it's okay. We just had a bunch of vaginas. <laughs> and I mean, what? I think that was it, though. They just needed a few more, and that's what we're getting for season two, apparently. So maybe now. Is, is this, I mean, is this just gimmicky? Is it just like we've got to try and generate headlines somehow? Uh, I don't know. Well, like, so. It and this is, is, is a very serious point now. Imagine being brought on for Rings of Power. You're direct, let's just say they go, you're directing episode four. Here's like the script. You'll be directing. It's like, this is a role you've been looking forward to having for a while, blah, blah, blah. And they introduce you as like, you're one of the new women. And then everyone claps. You just be like, no, no, I'm I'm like a person. I, 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 have, a, I have a history. I'm, I'm here to show off what I can do as a director. I'm not just a woman. Like, the, 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 what is that? Like, I'd be so fucking pissed if I was a person of vagina. That. what are they doing being like we have an all women selection isn't that like celebrate I, I, us like, what do you mean I, I, it made me wonder as well okay so cool uh when are we getting a show that's got all male directors like specifically and that we're gonna call it out like time's up drinker time is up <laughs> It's just like how can you how can you get away with like announcing something like that oh man <laughs> as his time is up Oh shit, where's everyone gone? Where's, where have they all gone? <laughs> I don't know what the fuck happened? <laughs> it's, it's the all-female directing crew has just cottoned onto the stream and two of that us... Is, oh my god, I'm going to be next. We've blasphemed. <laughs> I'm going to get taken out. But yeah, it's like, how do you... Uh, how is it acceptable to announce something like that and, and expect to get plaudits for it? Like, what are you, what are you actually accomplishing by doing that? It's like, yeah, we're just... Uh, 
we're going to discriminate against half the population because that's yeah. a good thing to do, apparently. It's it's really weird. So there are some of these things, and I think we were chatting some of this on, on Mr. Brown as well. So like, there are some of these decisions when they're announced and when they're made, which, which generate free publicity that the studio won't have to pay, uh, pay for. So if you're saying Rings of Power has all-female writing team, you're going to get a huge number of news outlets without any payment from the studio, effectively advertising something that the studio yeah. has done and keeping it in the front of the collective consciousness. And that's sort of the reason behind some of the like the race baiting stuff that you saw around Obi Wan as well, which is just mountains of free publicity because people don't pay attention to the articles, but they do notice the name in the headline. So that's a bit of it. I don't think that can really explain this one very much, though, given that we're years now away from Re Rings of Power season two. Um, so there's not going to be a huge publicity push for that at this stage. And it's also, it's a really weird decision just sort of in, in terms of your audience. So there was a study or someone tried to do a study, I think back in 2018, um, judging audience responses to shows with uh, writers' rooms of different gender makeups. So if you had, uh, see, comedy is disproportionately male. Um, and if you injected more females into the writer's room, what does that do to your audience appreciation of that thing? The study itself was very deeply flawed. It only considered a few sort of of the important variables. But one of the things it showed was that if you've got, say, 90% of your writer's room is, is men, and then it goes down to 60%, men's enjoyment of that thing doesn't change a huge amount. It drops two, three percent in terms of, I think they were just basic, basic on like Nielsen ratings and IMDb scores, so it's not very scientific. But if you increase the number of women in the writer's room, women's appreciation for the thing changes dramatically. So the, the more women in there, women's responses to that change at a far greater degree than men's do. So, but that only works up to the point of gender parity. If you start getting into, say, majority female writers' rooms, the results, I think, change a little bit. And if you have an entirely female writers' room, I don't think there was anything around at the time the study was done, which showed what audience reactions were to that. But I think now we've seen things like She-Hulk, um, or even Ghostbusters 2016, which it wasn't an entirely female writers' room, but it was disproportionately so, or more so than anything comparable. The male audience does, does tend to switch off from that because it, you know, by and large, men and women do actually have certain different preferences and, and things they want to see from characters, character oh! arcs, character progression. Shocking thing to say, I know. But that's why a mixed writer's room, generally speaking, outperforms a writer's room of either gender, which is too balanced toward male or female. Um, Rings of Power, in that case, has gone in entirely the wrong direction by simply reversing Ferret and going in the opposite direction rather than simply trying to you know, balance the writer's room. Yeah. Remember well, I think in this case, this is we're, we're talking initially about directors, but uh, I, I don't know, maybe they'll, they'll go down that road as well with the writer's room and say, well, we'll make that all female as well, because it, it gets us some headlines and so on. Um, is one of the, I know one of the people is brought on is associated with Wheel of Time, aren't they? But I think that's season two of Wheel of Time, which hasn't come out yet. So they can't necessarily be damned by association with season one. But hmm. I, I wouldn't have thought it's going to encourage a number of the fans of Rings of Power to learn that somebody involved in the second large uh, desecration of a fantasy product has now been attached to the biggest fantasy desecration. I, I, I just dare them to bring on some of the Witcher writers and, <laughs> and really tout that. <laughs> Fresh off the success of The Witcher, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but the Reel of Time was a fucking disaster. Why? It, it is such. It is such a bizarre announcement because it's not. If you just heard, oh, we're just having a whole female directors for season two, you just roll your eyes and go, you know, fuck it, whatever, you know, silly, silly double downing. But when they were like, and they've come from failed shows, and you just, so you just kind of like, eh? So you're you're proud of bringing on board people directors from f failed shows to push your failed show into season two. It's, it's the, on, like there's <laughs> such a massive disconnect there. It's on the plus side as uh, possibly an opportunity for Patty Jenkins. <laughs> 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 well, people are telling me as well, by the way, that apparently the, the God of War TV show is the thing that's going to happen, and the people behind Wheel of Time are attached to it as creators. Oh. Of the, and it's just like, Jesus <laughs> no. Christ. Good luck. And that's the thing, isn't it? It's just another one. Another one bites the dust. Yeah. If we can get Christopher Judge to play Kratos, then there's hope. But I don't even, yeah. honestly, I don't even know what they would even think about the thing is i just automatically assume it'll be horrible so <laughs> like yeah uh, 
I mean, the, the games are essentially movies at this point anyway, because they're so cinematic. So <clears throat> that's probably the best version of, of God of War that you're ever going to get, really. You definitely don't need a TV show for God of War. Yeah. No. Um, you know the, why? Uh, you don't need a fucking TV show for anything now. <laughs> Just <laughs> stay the fuck away. Fuck you, TV. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the only other thing I was going to touch upon there was uh, this is something that was doing the rounds, and I don't know how much validity there is in this, but uh, there was there was rumors going around that came from John Williams himself, the the composer for the Indiana Jones um, movies, that uh, they are doing more reshoots on Indy Five. They're having to do a whole new ending. Now this is what he <laughs> said um, at whole a concert recently, where he was a uh, guest conductor. Um, and yeah, he kind of let it slip that uh, he's going to be helping them out because they are going to be doing another reshoot on Indy 5 uh, to do a new ending in a few weeks. And I don't know, man. Like, I've heard rumors of test screenings being absolutely disastrous. Um, the, the, the premise behind this movie sounds awful in the extreme. And if the rumors are true, God help it. <laughs> like, I don't know what they're going to do. It sounds awful. Um, but yeah, the, the, that's the rumors doing the rounds at the moment. I don't know if you guys have heard anything about this at all. It was on Twitter for a fair bit. I saw yeah. John Williams's little speech. Oh, sorry. After you asked. No, I was just going to say, yeah, I saw, I saw the, the little speech and Indy fives is dead. The whole thing's dead. There's just it, it, the whole price. Look, you would touch Phoebe Waller bridge to anything. You fucking killed your product. <laughs> You've just killed your yeah. product right there. And then if if you're a man, then you're just like, there's no fucking point in me even watching this. None whatsoever. Uh, if if the rumors of time travel and Indy being wiped from existence and her taking over and the whole of it just sounds dreadful. And I don't want to watch an 80-year-old Indiana Jones. Yeah. You know, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, uh, uh, Temple of Doom, Last Crusade, this is a man at the peak of his career peak of his physicality and and that's why that trilogy was so wonderful 14 years ago we were talking about harrison ford's too old to bring indiana jones back <laughs> with the crystal scope the 14 years ago and we were correct everyone the film was dreadful it was appalling had none of the the charm the special effects were dog shit and it was like, no, this is a young man's game. And, and as much as, you know, you might love Harrison Ford or Indiana Jones, and I do, because I think the first tr trilogy is one of the greatest trilogies of all time. You can't have then, 14 years later, an eight-year-old coming out going, let's do it, but this time, it's feminism. And you have Phoebe Waller-Britt, oh, no, just no, no. <laughs> no, no. John, Williams, um, John Williams is actually saying in that in that speech he gave. John Williams said, um, "You know, the, I, I'm I'm getting on a bit now. Um, Harrison's a much younger man than I am." Says the 91 year old. He's yeah. 78. But I thought, you know, if if Harrison's got one more in him, then I should have one more in me as well. But if a really like ancient man is saying that, well, okay, Harrison's pretty old, but you know, he's not quite as old as me. He's probably too old to play Indiana Jones still. 78 is way too old. I mean, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, I didn't think the problem with that necessarily was his age. I think I think you could have done that in the sense of if it were a proper passing the torch film and they had like elements of that in there because you had Shia LaBeouf doing some of the running and the jumping and the fighting. Yeah. We just don't do passing the torch films well anymore because the person you're passing the torch to is invariably an ungrateful little shit, frankly. Um and that's the kind of thing, if you're going to do another Indiana Jones with a near 80-year-old Harrison Ford, you need somebody younger than him to whom he is passing the torch. But who is that? Is that going to be Phoebe Waller-Bridge? I don't want to see that particularly. I, I, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I don't know why I don't know why she became a thing as an actress. Like, I can get that she's she's got a certain talent for writing. Um, if you, you know, if you really like female-led comedy, then, you know, fantastic. Uh, I'm sure you can have a ball with her stuff. It's not to my taste, but I can see why she's successful at it. Um, as an actress, I, I don't understand how she can possibly headline any kind of um, TV show or new franchise as this, like, whip-cracking adventurer that's going to, like, be the equal of Indiana Jones. Like, it just 
it doesn't ring true. It doesn't make any sense. Do you remember I, I Solo? She's not that kind of actress. Remember, remember, remember Solo, lead her character. She was very good as Lando's sex robot. What are you talking robot about? Robot rights. Running robot Fantastic. rights. Oh, move out of the I, way, you. I, I still, I still <laughs> laugh at the bit where he tries to pull her corpse along the ground and like her, yeah. her legs <laughs> come off. <laughs> <laughs> what were they thinking? But then, but then she was put into the Millennium Falcon to forever be there. Yeah. Uh, that, that was such a stain. It's like, push it away. She was brought in to go over the script for the last Bond movie mm -hmm. and make sure that it was whammon friendly and track running correctly. So she was, she's been brought in as a troubleshooter in Hollywood to make sure that uh, the scripts which are being produced aren't fucking masculine and uh, make sure they tick all the right boxes for feminist agendas. So she's, she's more than just some god awful actress that looks like a fucking anemic horse. Uh, she's got she's got this throw God. with with her. Which she looks like a fucking brutal. She looks like a horse that's just ready to be fucking put down. You know, it's just like it's, it's just got nothing. It's got no fucking iron in its system. You know, it's got a big fucking mole just wadged onto the side of the fucking head. It's just like it's knackered. Just put it down. Take her out back, back of the head. Glue bottle. So she's got she's got more of a throw than just. Being in front of a camera, it's what she does behind the camera that ruins a lot. Apparently, she's yeah. having influence on the script for Indy as well. So, well, I, I'd heard that her character, and this is again just rumors, but like that she's basically going around like correcting all of his like outdated attitudes. So when he's like, "Oh, there's Indians over there," she'd be like, "Well, actually, they should be called indigenous people," uh, and just little things like that, just bringing in all the the twenty first century you know, identity politics stuff into this classic adventure franchise. And it just sounds like the absolute death of fun. Um, I, I don't know how a character like that is ever supposed to work or why anyone would ever like it. Uh, it's like they've they've taken the, the basic tenets of the, the indie movies, the things that made them so enjoyable, and reversed them in a character like that. Um mm. It doesn't work within sort of the time span the shows are set in. Indiana Jones is the hero of that sort of 40s, 50s mold. You know, he is the swashbuckling, Nazi punching hero. As soon as you get him toward 60s, 30s. 70s, he, he, would act, he would be on the opposing side to the cultural zeitgeist of the time his films are now set in. He, he has no option but to be an incredibly grumpy and, and reactionary old man because he would be looking around at 60s student culture for one thing which has birthed so many of, of the modern 21st century um uh, faux pas uh, and he would be hating that kind of thing and so he he's going to be a man out of time in both senses he's a man out of time in the sense that he's too old to play the role he's a man out of time in the sense that the era his character is set in is the one that his character is least suited to he has to be a miserable cynical old man and he has to be shown up by the new younger upstarts and it's very hard to see how you can be faithful to the era the show set in without turning him into the very thing that we don't want him to see turn into but the thing is, consider as well that the audience that they're supposedly appealing to here, you know, they obviously want to, with this, pass the torch on to a younger character. Um, I don't know what age Phoebe Waller-Bridge is. I'm assuming she's in her 30s still. Someone who could carry on the franchise for a while anyway that's going to appeal to modern audiences. She's female. She's, you know, she ticks a lot of the boxes. I think she's implied to be a lesbian as well in this because, of course, she is. Yeah. Um, but... Young people, like people, like kids, I guess, now that they're going to try and appeal to and launch this new character, they're not going to care about Indiana Jones. They're too fucking young to appreciate that. Like the, the, the audience of these movies is our age and older. You know, it's people who kind of grew up with the original trilogy and like appreciated them from their childhoods. Those are not the kind of people that are going to enjoy a character like this. They're going to hate it because they're she's supplanting Indy and she's basically just there to mock and belittle him and make him look like a an antiquated relic of a different time. So it's like they put themselves into an impossible situation where the audience that they want to attract isn't going to be interested in it in the first place and the only audience that they do have are going to be alienated by what they're trying to do with this new film. It's, it's a lose-lose situation for them. Do they care? 
I mean, I this mean is the, you'd, you'd, you'd assume they would. Well, you'd you'd assume if they were regular, normal, functioning human beings, they would. But we've seen the most ridiculous decisions over at Marvel. We've seen the most ridiculous decisions over at Disney with Star Wars. We've seen the most ridiculous decisions with DC. These these people are clearly out of touch. I I, I likened it on one of my streams to they're trying to force feed you your your vegetables because they think. You know, you're the little child because that's where they see you. And they're trying to force feed you vegetables. These are, you've got to eat your vegetables. Come on, force it down. But they're not. They're, we're grown adults and they're trying to put shit in his mouths. And they make these, these ridiculous decisions which aren't made for entertainment purposes because entertainment now apparently is a privilege. So we're not allowed to have entertainment. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to see the plight of the Inuit fucking Eskimos up in Greenland as they try and find a fish, we've got to, you know, find out about the oil spills. They just want to push every sort of agenda at us. And when it comes to something like Indiana Jones, they're going to look at the male aspect of him, then they're going to look at the toxicity aspect of him, and they're going to try and deconstruct that. She'll take the piss out of him. He'll be an absolute buffoon. He'll be tripping up, falling over, and all this kind of stuff. And then we'll, we'll see flashbacks to when he was a toxic man. And oh, it's going to destroy it's just going to destroy the legacy of the character this film is a terrible idea from the outset the people involved i can't see any good faith anywhere in this reshoots you can do all you want to change it it's still going to be an mitigated disaster if you want to reboot indiana jones go ahead i think that would still fail anyway because the whole aspect of indiana jones was harrison ford he is he embodies that character and we're living in a culture where people just think you can just immediately transplant somebody and it'll have the same effect as it as it would before, as it did previously. That's not the case. It's never going to be the case. It's not just an investment in the character. It's also an investment in the person who's playing the character. There will never, ever be anyone who could ever play Columbo, for, ex uh, for instance, other than Peter Falk. You could put as many people into that role and try and try and try... They will never, ever be Peter Fall. There will never be that true embodiment of Columbo. And it's the case, you know, you pick another franchise and another franchise. Har you know, Han Solo was a perfect example. Again, that is Harrison Ford. It's not... I can't even remember the actor's <laughs> name. Aaron Ehrenreich. Aaron Alden Peterson. Reich, yeah, all those uh, Aaron, Aaron Smith. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's some vanilla fucking white bland piece of bread that had nothing, not a, a single solitary characteristic which married up uh, to the Han Solo that we had seen on the screen before. Hollywood are going to continue to throw this at us until somebody at the company or some shareholders go, do you know what? Can we have some money, please? Can we make some bloody money, please? I don't, I don't see this changing. That that There's... time that time is coming though, right? So that if you look at the any any demographic which is most susceptible to that kind of creative destruction, that that sense of nihilism, um, the the term woke is used I think too much, but just a shorthand. The people most likely to fall for that kind of thing or to espouse that kind of thing are incredibly affluent and they've benefited from a long period of very easy money. And these are the people that studios now employ in the decision making departments, and that's why films now don't really have entertainment as their core purpose it is messaging first because money hasn't really been too much of a consideration in the last decade really for film studios i mean it's been it's been such a great time for stocks in the last decade generally speaking that is coming to an end though and that will come to an end in, in quite a nasty way which is why you're seeing so many layoffs in big media companies they all thought it would be restricted to big tech but you know the washington post is laying off an entire generation of reporters who were bought in who espoused exactly oh. that kind of mindset which i you know i a former journalist but i don't cry at all to see them being given the marching orders the problem is going to be, though, when we get into these very straightened times which are coming, when studios do have no choice but to revert to the bottom line, what properties are they going to have left which are guaranteed cash spinners? Because if you've already wrecked Star Wars and if you've already wrecked Indiana Jones and if you've already wrecked The Lord of the Rings and if you've already wrecked even down to, we're now down to the level of Willow, what have they got yeah. left? 
to actually guarantee the money coming in anymore. And there's going to be some very, very difficult decisions for studios to make going forward. And in some cases, especially where they've really shelled out, as Disney's done on acquiring other smaller studios with the promise of big returns in future, they've they've burned through a lot of the, the potential capital that they have there. So it will be very interesting to see the kind of projects they prioritize over the next decade when they don't have money they can just spunk up a wall, basically. Mm. I'd be curious if they come for um, Farscape at some point. I wonder... I mean that's. Mm. I mean, well, I was going to say that's pretty obscure, but then they went for Willow, didn't they? So yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Any, Maybe. Anything could. They could reboot Stargate SG One, I suppose. Like, you know. oh, they are have apparently. They, have, they, have they done Buffy yet? They were gonna, but then they stopped. But I imagine there's a timer <laughs> on that one. They're they're going to get Back to the Future. I guarantee it. Ooh. Eventually, they'll get their hands on it. Uh, yeah, there's a good point here made as well, because this is an argument that comes up quite a bit. It's that Mangold made Logan and Ford versus Ferrari, though. Uh, that is true, but then being a good director doesn't guarantee you're going to make great movies. Like uh, You're kind of dependent on the script that you're given and or that you, you're able to produce. Like It doesn't matter how well, talented you are as a director, you, you might still produce a shit film at the end of it. I think the, the straightforward easy one is just the same man who made Alien made Alien Covenant. So Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. oh, Granted, God. it was many years later, but still. Yeah. Um, them's the breaks, I suppose. Like, uh, well, we kind of predicted it's going to be shit. I'm, I have little doubt that it will be. We can all sit back and laugh about it, I suppose. And hey, on the on the off chance that it turns out to somehow be amazing, hey, <laughs> we get to watch a good mil- a good movie. So, I guess we're all right either way, I suppose. Um, yeah, I'm still waiting for that bit to happen, though. Yeah. Well, you got Avatar coming out tomorrow. Yay. Yay. Um, I, can't, I can't wait to watch that one. So, have to set aside a whole day for it because it's about five hours long. Isn't yeah, it? it's, it's three so, hours long, man. So depressing. I'm just finishing off the Wakanda Forever review. And I thought, yeah, I might have a couple of weeks between, you know, subaqueous blue people. But no, I'm going straight into Avatar as soon as I yeah. finished it. More underwater Smurfs. That's exactly what we needed. Yeah. I am. Um, in prep for Avatar 2, I asked if uh, Freeman would watch Avatar 1. We did, and man, uh, I've I've been entirely put off from seeing Avatar 2 by watching I, Avatar 1 again. I hate that film so much. I mean, it's, it's one of my yeah. least favorite things. I can't it, remember the last time I watched it, but this time around, man, that was not fun. I did not enjoy watching Avatar 1 uh, as, a, as a rewatch, just as a refresh. It, um, I don't know what happened. The writing in it is so horrifically, like... I think bad compared to what James Cameron's usually capable of. Well, this is the thing people often say about Cameron. For some reason, they've started saying this now. It's like, oh, he's a great action director, but he can't do dialogue and he can't do characters. It's like, have you fucking seen um, Terminator Two? Like, have you seen <laughs> Aliens? Like, he can do characters and he can do perfectly good dialogue. It's, but he has to be interested in it. So, like, Avatar yes. is best understood as you know, like, um, when big like Ford for example will put out this concept car it will never actually be made but the artwork's all done it looks amazing and it's it's a tech demonstration effectively all this is is just a sales pitch for the kind of thing we might theoretically do in the future look how amazing and imaginative we are we'll never make the car but it looks lovely doesn't it avatar is is basically that it's a it's a sales room car showroom type thing all it is is look what we can do with vfx these days um by the way, oh, I guess we're supposed to have a story to turn into a film, so we'll just steal that from, I don't know, Dances with Wolves or Pocahontas or something. But look how amazing it is. And the only, like, the pre-release reviews I've seen for um, the, the new Avatar, the last Smurf Bender, whatever it's called, the, one of the main ones I saw said, um, it looked so it looked so amazing, I sometimes lost track of the plot. I like, well, yeah, <laughs> in which case it's done its job, because I'm pretty sure it's not going to have much of one at all. Well, I think Chris Gore pretty much confirmed what we suspected when he came on last week because he'd <laughs> seen it in advance and he was like yeah it looks fantastic um plot is weak as fuck and it's got like massive holes in it but uh, yeah, he said the, the writer was so bad it was unusual for him to do it but he has to ask other people at the end like if they noticed what he noticed or something like that right yeah not a good sign but then he was um, like but it's got a really nice message about family in it and it's like well okay great but that's that's not enough <laughs> to make it a good movie <laughs> like, oh, oh, three more fucking than that. hours <laughs> Yeah, mm. that's that kind of just comes across as pretentious. This is, By the this way, is blue people saving a tree. Rewatching <laughs> the first it. one, I reminded myself of how much I enjoy um, 
I don't know if he was a colonel, but Quaritch, he's like the one thing I really, really like about the film. The sergeant dude played by uh, Stephen Lang. Well, not he's like, cliche. You've got like a really charismatic actor playing him, and he seems like he's having a lot of fun there. And I was almost like cheering for him. <laughs> like, yeah, no, fuck, so, the, I, fuck I, the, I the Navi. Want. I want to yeah. kill them all. <laughs> That's part of my frustration with the film is I actually felt kind of like he was kind of, I understood him better than a lot of the... <laughs> Like, he's this guy who's like, his job is very clear. And the, I, what I really like about him is a lot of his dialogue reflects how much he cares about his men. Um, in high stress situations, he usually sends out warnings and makes sure everyone's doing what they're supposed to do. Um, I enjoy that about him. Also, just the competence levels are through the roof for him in, in what it could be a situations where he could be fucking much worse off. Like the part where he just, he finds out they're leaving the base, right? With taking a. A ship and he just immediately opens the door uh mm. holds his breath gets a machine gun and just starts unloading on them as they're leaving it's like it's stuff like that makes him really cool um yeah i didn't like much else <laughs> like it was a struggle i don't know well it's just it, everything is framed in such like ridiculously binary black and white terms you know are you which which side are you going to support here are you going to support the peaceful spiritual like in tune with nature navi who are just wonderful no. about everything or are you going to support the evil like ridi like ridiculously imperialistic colonizers who want to like destroy everything in their path and strip mine the entire planet it's like you're not really giving me much to work with here like you could put a little bit of nuance in there you could you know give the humans perhaps an understandable motivation for why they're doing this. It's like, no, they're just straight up evil and you must hate them because we tell you to. I mean, it's like, it's, it's, everything about it is, is derivative. Everything about it is derivative. I mean, the plot is obviously, is basically Dances with Wolves, but everything, even down to the sound design, half of the animals on Pandora use sound effects that have just been lifted straight from Jurassic Park. So one of the big ones does the T-Rex roar. There's about six different Velociraptor sound effects. Uh, the soundtrack, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, the composer, but he uses the exact same note-for-note um, -note motif that he uses in Troy. Um, the, the entire thing is just a, a rehash designed to give the veneer of substance to what is just there to look pretty. It's, it's such a bad film. Yeah, yeah. hyper-generic. Uh, you can spot everything happening well before it does. It's all very... Is that why it's so popular? Is it like the perfect factory-made movie or something? I say popular, I just mean it made a lot of money. I don't know, because I, just... I saw it, I thought it was shit! I think yeah. it was, I guess, just one of those completely undemanding movies that just sort of washes over you. Like, you can just passively consume it and not really have to think about it. Just look at the pretty colours on screen. Uh, and I think that was the draw for a lot of people. You could go into that movie and be dumb as fuck and still get as much out of it as, like, a person with a 200 IQ. Because it's leaves, that kind of low-level movie, you know? It leaves no cultural mark, though. So there are plenty of films like that which have had equivalent amounts of initial acclaim. You know, the first tranche of people to go and see it, uh, bump it up to do you know, record-breaking numbers at the box office. But usually, a film that does that well at the box office will still be talked about a few years after it's come out. It's left some kind of cultural mark. Nobody can forget the, the obvious examples being Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Lord of the Rings, all of these very, very successful films, which also defined like, a cultural zeitgeist for themselves. Avatar is the film that you say, oh yeah, that came out. I remember that about 10 years after it happened. It's left nothing, it's added nothing. There's nothing about Avatar when people now will go and say, oh yeah, do you remember that bit in the film when the, the blue people did the thing for the, for the tree? There's no equivalent iconography, there's no equivalent storytelling trope, there's no, it has, hasn't spawned a cliche even. It's just, it just exists and everyone forgets that it exists until they're told, oh yeah, Avatar was a thing. Shall we maybe watch that again one day? Yeah, fine, why not? Well, I think it, it then, it didn't spawn it, but it led into that era of movies that did make those crazy amounts of money. Like, it became commonplace for movies to make over a billion dollars, and some were up in the realms of two billion. Like, you, even when you get to something like Endgame, you know, like, the, the highest grossing movie of all time, it didn't make a, a real cultural impact afterwards. Like, none of us talk about Avengers Endgame as, like, you know, wow, the, you know, remember that bit when this happened? Like, again, same thing. It, it's just... What could I equate it to? It's like when you're a little kid and you go to, like, the, you know, your parents take you to a local restaurant and you have, like, a, a, a dessert there and it's, like, the greatest thing you've ever tasted... Um, but then you start going to like restaurants all the time and it's just like, you know, it's commonplace then you don't, it doesn't make any impact on you because you've, you've experienced it so many times before. Um, and it, it's that same, I guess, desensitization to all of this stuff. 
maybe. I mean, I think Endgame is slightly different because Endgame is the culmination of a story that has actually added significant things to the cultural collective consciousness. I mean, everyone knows who Tony Stark is. Everyone knows who Captain America is. Um, I know some people have decided to forget. Steve Rogers. Most people do. Steve, <laughs> exactly. Steve Are you Rogers saying people Captain don't know America. who Jake Sully is? The legendary Jake <laughs> Sully. <laughs> oh, that was his name. Yeah, I did wonder. But um, they, they, no, they, they, something like that is a collective entity like the MCU, like as the sum total of everything that it's done, yeah, it's a massive like influence it's had on cinema. But like if you take individual movies and kind of like break them down, like they they don't. They're they're part of a larger whole. They um, are, but I mean if you're thinking so the point of comparison with Avatar, Avatar is the thing which is supposed to be kick starting the franchise. So the point of comparison isn't endgame. <laughs> the point of comparison is the original Iron Man film, which has added more to the cultural memory. Tony Stark is Iron Man for the first time or James Cameron's Avatar. But James Cameron put Avatar out twelve years ago? Hmm. Ish. Two thousand nine, yeah, so Right, 13. so twelve thirteen years ago. And, uh, you know, that's a long time. And since then, all we've had for the last decade is, is a bukake of CGI special effects, CGI special effects to varying degrees. That Wonderland of, ooh, that's nice, because it had the, remember, Avatar had the 3D attached to it. Mm -hmm. That was one of the, the sort of, like, selling points for it. And and now it's just like, we we we're so apathetic to special effects because they're so overused and so overdone even if the special effect uh, special effects in this movie are sensational and absolutely they look they look great you you couldn't tell a a, a navi from a birdie fly you know you'd just be like so what i've seen this all before i've seen i've still seen special effects all before this is nothing uh, enriching or enhancing and and the story of Avatar was so basic and bland that the it was the special effects which were wowing people in in this this age. Mm. Uh, so I don't see how, even with great special effects, this most likely and I'll tell you tomorrow because I've got to see the fucking thing for Friday mm. Night Tights. I'll tell you tomorrow um, exactly how bland that story is, and it's it could do astronomical weekend or even week but after that first week it's going to yeah i had forgotten can... about this the hair braids the yeah. interlock with animals. Plug so basically you plug in yeah you animals have, have basically USB got stuff. usb ports on yeah. pandora and you can just plug into them and take control i'd forgotten how more... fucking dumb this film is dude the yeah. more you think about it the more <laughs> it gets weird oh god i must have purged that from my mind and now it's back it's a, <sighs> it's a, it's a very strange film i think uh, to, to say one maybe positive thing about it, the fact that the special effects are the point of it means that they will also be its legacy in the same way as the first Avatar film showcased what was possible and then what was possible became industry standard. Maybe this film is, is again, it, it is a showpiece for what is now possible in CGI. We, we, we've seen sort of the phase one Avatar, post-Avatar CGI. Maybe the last Smurf Bender will give us, you know, a new level of CGI, which will become industry standard over the subsequent decade. But I prefer my films to actually have stories. And you know, I don't really mind if they don't look as good. But mm -hmm. I, would, I would much rather they told me a, a good story with good characters, which are, you know, funny, witty, innovative, um, just generally enjoyable. And if I wanted to see a, a high-tech exposition, I would go to a high-tech exposition or I'd watch the ILM documentary. But I, I don't watch films for that reason. I, I think, uh, yeah, a really good story with really compelling characters that you cared a great deal about is what would have drawn people back for this movie after so long. But mm. because the first movie doesn't didn't produce that, you know, and it didn't even leave us with any like unresolved mysteries or like plot threads that were hanging. It was it was a self contained story. I feel like it wrapped everything up as it was. So, yeah, like I guess like as was saying, you know, I'm sure this is going to be visually stunning. But then we we live in an era when we've had a lot of visually stunning movies, and I guess the question would be like, well, how much better can it possibly be that would really wow people at this point? So if you don't have the wow factor and you don't have compelling characters and, and, a, and a great story thread that you can pick up to draw people back in, I don't know what the, the draw is going to be. I, I don't know if it's just going to be, well, it's not a superhero movie, so it's something different. You want to go and watch that instead? I mean, that might work for some people. Um, the question that came in here was like, will it reach a billion? I mean, yeah, it probably will. I don't see it getting to two billion. I don't think no. it'll get anywhere near that. 
I think maybe it'll reach 1.5, but that's probably where it'll top out. But that's almost that's self fulfilling as well. Um, so we saw it with Wakanda Forever, um, when every other studio around that might have thought about releasing a film at around this time will not release that film because they know that Avatar will be the competitor. So every other studio drops out. Nobody releases another film. Avatar is the only thing that's out. So it's really the only thing to bother going to see, which is then self-reinforcing. If Avatar is the only thing that's out, of course, it will make more money. But actually, if it did have competitors, and certainly with Wakanda Forever, when the same dynamic was in play, if Wakanda Forever had competitors, I know it actually did underperform anyway, but I think it would have underperformed even more because it, it is this, this self-perpetuating myth. If you just assume as a studio that your rival will make a lot of money, you are going to ensure that it makes more money than it would have done had you actually given it something to compete with. Hmm. Well, fair play. Um, well, we do have a few super chats that have come in. If, uh, if you've got a little bit of time, maybe we could do a few before we finish up. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let me bring them up here. So the first one that came in was from Kevin O'Neill, who said, teasing everyone about Cavill's return, misleading Cavill himself only to pull the rug out from under him. Yet another chapter in the Hollywood handbook, How to Lose Your Audience, A Guide to yeah. Avoiding Success. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Uh, he also said, the DCU failed to emulate the MCU's success, yet they succeeded in emulating their failures. Still got something that will keep some fans invested. Get rid of it. What a clown show. What a waste. Let's... A perfect summary, I would say, of what they've been doing. It's just a complete waste. Waste of opportunities, waste of potential. Uh, Ulysses Venezuela says, With Cavill's exit, I'm done with DC. I'm just done. I I've heard a lot of that tonight. Yep. I've heard uh, a lot of that tonight. Kung, Kung Fu Hot Dog says, hey, hey, drinker, watch Angry Joe's reaction to Cavill's news. At this point, Gunn feels like Lex Luthor, who's out to ruin DC. Looking forward to Avatar 2 now. <laughs> Yeah, you guys were mentioning Angry Joe earlier. He was losing his shit, apparently. He's very Tim favorite upset. character. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and he he's heard about the uh, the whole like idea for what story is going to be told with this next Superman. He's very very upset. He he doesn't want to. He doesn't want that. He wants bigger stories for Superman. Um, we'll see. You know, we'll see what happens. Uh, the next one is a four parter. So. Bear with me on this one, gentlemen. I'll try and rattle through it. It's from Chuck Sennhausen, who said, Oh yes, I've been waiting for the sweet and sensual as to come back on. Not mm. only does he reply to all the super chats, which is appreciated, but I've been meaning to ask him this question. Dear Az, how do you find the time to not just make content in, on your page, but also the time to join in on all the live shows? I know you've been working extra hard at the gym recently, on top of seeing all of your girlfriends too, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no need to be modest about it with how successful your channel is, plus you, your rugged good looks. I've got no doubt you have the ladies staying overnight at your flat all the time. Wow. How do you, how do you find uh, the time, sir? Chucks and Housen, uh, clearly the check cleared. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, whew, thank God for that. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Look, I, I, uh, I you know, I, my, I'm very, I've only just met little platoon today but um you know i love i love drinker and molly i love my drinkers and my mollies and oh we love um, you too man i love you <laughs> it's, it's fun to do you know it's fun to do these things and um you know Mola and drinker i mean i'd obviously do a show real bbc with Mola, but you know drinkers uh been very kind to come onto my show multiple times uh the kind of networking that we do it's it's i think it's fun we get on uh, and it's and it's interesting to shoot the shit. We don't necessarily agree all the time. And that can make things even more interesting from time to time. Uh, <laughs> but you know, obviously, a lot of stuff we we do. Uh, I've only been to the gym twice in two and a half years. Uh, <laughs> but but it was this Monday and it was this Wednesday, and it is going to be tomorrow to make it three. So I'm just doing baby steps to uh, to try and make some some changes. As for rotating door of women into my house, well. <laughs> that just goes without fucking saying. Just swimming in the vag. Swimming <laughs> in the moose. You have to fight them off. And yeah. that's before oh, the gym. That's before the gym. Imagine a yeah. few months after gym, you'll have like, a, like a harem of 3,000 women a day. Henry Cavill will be phoning me up for tips. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but you can, you can buy a hot dog, though. 
Yes. Is it still available to order? It is. Got a week left. All right. So, because I, I didn't know that it was still there. But yes, for anyone who's watching, if you're still looking for an As Hot Dog Man plushie, uh, they are available through Makeship. So just search for it right now and get yourself one because they look fantastic. Um, the next Can one. I drop a link in the chat. Is that okay? Yes. Um, if That'd be very kind. The... Here, I'll drop uh, in the private chat for you. Uh, okay, I'll see if I can pop this up. Oosh. All right. Once the, there you go. That's how. <laughs> Come on to flock my way. <laughs> flog my ways. Yeah. You're just using us as. Yeah, I know. Khajiit. All right, Was there it? you go. Way. Right, I'll leave that up there for a little while. Uh, the next question is from Stephen Bobo, who says, This is for Drinker and the whole panel. What is your overall opinion on the DC animated version of Superman, voiced by Tim Daly and George Newborn? Superman the animated series. Mine's very oh, quick because I, I haven't seen it, so I have no opinion. I, yeah, I haven't seen it. Mm. Oh, sorry, man. <laughs> don't think any of us have watched it. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, Angry Batman says, Henry is like a beaten puppy that goes to a new owner only oh. to get beaten again. Oh. So infuriating and sad. <laughs> mm. Henry, get in <laughs> contact Henry. with me. We'll paint some Warhammer figures together. Henry, if you're really hard up for roles, I can put you in Rogue Elements. So we'll find a, <laughs> we'll find a place for you. <laughs> it's got a wonderful craft table. It does look good, yeah. Um, he also said, on a happier note, my 18-month-old son, Parker, likes to yell, go away at people when we're in public. No idea where he learned that. <laughs> hey, that's my boy. <laughs> nice one. Uh, Mr. Taco Boutique says, and there's a few of them here, so... They want to start from a clean slate, so the decision of a rebuild makes sense, and it's clear why they understand people like Cavill, so they will try to keep him around in another possible role along with Affleck. If anything, this is previous Warner Brother Head's fault for letting Snyder do his nonsense and not having a plan. Sad, but okay with moving on from Cavill as Superman, because they need to start fresh. Um... Though we can talk about The Rock purposely lying about Black Adam being profitable because his ego is through the roof. That's hilarious and sad. It's not impossible that DC has an upswing with all of the things they've done. It's not impossible. We'll, we'll see about it. But, you know, I'm obviously... I, I, I wouldn't have done it the way that he's done it. But, hey, like I said, he's he's in that position. I'm not. <laughs> There's a reason for that, I suppose. Yeah. But um, you, when what year did Iron Man come out? 2008. That is 14 years ago. And DC are now going, We're going to do a 10 year plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, uh, I guess to back up on that that super chat, like, yeah, I agree. I think it was a disaster, the, uh, the Snyder approach. I think it was horrifying what happened to Batman and Superman. And the. Uh, that absolute nightmare movie, Batman vs. Superman, like that just mm -hmm. crashed everything. I think everything that splintered off from that was already doomed. And uh, then we know what happened with Joss Whedon. And, and then, and then to be like, oh, let's try a Joker solo movie and a, a new Batman solo. Like, what What was the plan, guys? Well, I Man, think that, the... that's the point, right? So that it can't be worse than that. I would rather have a guy at the top who has a 10 year plan than have what we have just seen, which is no plan, scatterbrain, nonsense. It's the same thing with the Star Wars sequel trilogy. Like, How do you not go into that trilogy having an idea of what story you're telling across the oh, entire trilogy? I, I, I'm, I a think... much, I'm a big fan of, of people who actually have creative vision and direction, and either it will fail or it will succeed based on the merits of the story it's telling, but you actually have the direction first, and then you make the films according to that. The, the real worry, right, is that the, the leadership at DC has been this revolving door of executives over the past, like, five years. And it, it it's all well and good to say, well, we've brought in James Gunn and he's got this great plan now moving forward. Okay, fine. What if Zaslov gets ousted as uh, head of Warner Brothers and, you know, the, James Gunn goes out the door with him and then a new guy gets brought in and he says, ah, oh, you know what, we're going to bring Cavill back, actually, and do another Superman movie with him. Like, it, there's nothing is guaranteed with any of this. It could all change at the drop of a hat, and that's the problem, really. There's no sense of, like, continuity or stability within Warner because they, they've just not had the successes to justify it. And whatever 
um, James Gunn commissions whatever movies he sets in motion, it will be years before they actually get made. Yeah. And so it's, it, that's a long yeah. time where a lot of things could go wrong and he could just as easily get put, punted out the door. I don't know, man. It's that's just... True. um you know, I, I would rather see someone guaranteed a certain period of time where they can actually make their mark and whatever creative vision they've got actually comes to fruition instead of this half-assed approach where they constantly chop and change. Well, um, it, it, going back to that Batman v Superman from Mauler, I just don't understand where was the person to say no to Zack Snyder when he said, I'm going to create, like, The Dark Knight <laughs> and then The Dark Knight Returns and then we're going to move into the death of Superman by the end. Zach, no. No. You can't take two massively iconic moments in Batman and Superman, to a degree, with Dark Knight Returns, and the death of Superman and merge it into one movie. You know, the death of Superman was a potential trilogy of movies. Because you could have had the first movie being the fight with Doomsday, the escalation to the fight with Doomsday and the death. The second movie, bringing in the Superman, the reign of the Superman. And then the third movie, bringing back Superman into the but, fold. Wait, though, didn't Snyder want, like, basically, Batman versus Superman and Justice League, didn't he want them to be a trilogy instead of just two movies? And it was the studio that pressured him to move things along more quickly because they wanted their big superhero team-up film uh, they wanted their own version of the avengers so they could play catch up with marvel and i think some of that was like just him having to compromise to what the studio wanted i'm not trying to defend snyder on this one or anything because i think he still took the wrong approach but i think he was under a lot of studio pressure as well well yeah he you had like a huge <sighs> huge plan i have I ever spoken to you about that huge plan as your opinion on on zach's end game plans for the storylines of uh I'm assuming you know about the whole, like, when Superman is dead, Bruce and Lois hook up and have a kid. Uh, I, I might have heard something about that years ago. I remember uh, just so many DC fans like are like, yeah, it would be cool to see the whole plot. It's like, have you read what he planned? And then they're like, oh. Yeah, you don't want... You don't, but that's just it. You, Zack Snyder never had somebody to say no to him. I mean, I know he never did that part, but... The Justice League movie was going to be two films, Drinker. And that ended yes. up being one. And obviously we got the Snyder Cut because we got, you know, a bunch of the stuff uh, put in. But that was meant to be two movies. And it, it, you can't you can't jump the queue. You know, Marvel, when they started their, their uh, universe, they, they did it, metho you know, very methodically. And they earned the right to get to the Avengers, and they earned the right to 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 go to to further from there, bring in your ancillary characters from there. DC never earned the right because it just wanted to skip to the front of the queue, and it never did the yeah. hard work, and it never put the effort in, and it condensed stories that made no sense. So why on earth they thought it was ever going to be a success is is a mystery to me anyway. Um. Next one is from Unhinged, who says, I'm so excited for open bar. I'm glad I brought that extra Kleenex and lotion. I mean, wow. it's a sensible yeah. thing, really, isn't it? You've got to be ready. Um, JK Fozel said, Hail to the one who drinks and the one who is long. Hail to the panel and to chat. It has been a while since I have super chatted. I have been poor. Well, <clears throat> thank Aww. you very much, my friend. Thank you for your generosity. And now you are again. Yeah, courtesy <laughs> of us. <laughs> Grimnack28 says, Hello, gents. I need to tell you guys about one of the greatest adventure stories of all time, The Hunt for Second Breakfast, starring Scotty <laughs> and Pippin. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Kevin O'Neill, the drinker in panel, if this makes the live stream, I have never watched the James Bond movie. Recommend one now. Ooh. 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 I'm going to go Golden Eye. There you go. There's your recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> so, ooh. Well, I don't, I don't want to double up, so I want everyone to do... I don't want to double up, you know. Can I do the obvious one and say Golden Eye? Is that too obvious? Mola just said that. Ah, oh, I, I got it before himself. you. Damn it. <laughs> uh, I will say The Spy Who Loved Me, then, because I love that movie. It's my favorite. Really? Uh, yeah. Fuck, I, just, I, got, I... I got a story to tell you later. Fuck. Okay. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Okay. I, I'm so stuck. Like, my first Bond was Piers Brosnan, and even then I think I was too young for most of them. But 
if if you want Bond as sort of peak cheese, which I, I like about Bond, probably something like Moonraker. But oh yeah, okay. That's I will cheese. have to go with an absolute classic and say Goldfinger. Oh yes, good solid choice. choice. Solid choice. Because Sean Connery was the fucking man. So we've essentially given you four different movies there. So there's four different Bond movies to choose from. All from kind of different eras. So, mm. yeah. I like it. Um, yeah, anyway. Like next a one. moon raker. <laughs> As for the next Bond theme song, for sure. Yes! <laughs> Ocean my giant. Yeah. <laughs> I had to use that for no more. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Number uh, Dick, 72 in the iTunes UK charts, baby. You are a charting artist. I love I it. I am indeed. And it was <laughs> it was well deserved because it was it had it had a real magic to it. It was catchy. <laughs> uh here's a here's a one for all of us. JK Fozel says, How are you all doing? Uh what do you get from Subway? It's where I work, and I've been wondering if the open bar crew like gross sandwiches or good ones. <gasps> all right, so if you're in Subway, what do you go for? I go for Italian BMT on Italian and herb bread with red onion and sweet onion sauce. I'm not that different, actually. I go for the Italian BMT as well on hearty Italian bread. Um, and I get the Southwest sauce. Okay. And some jalapenos. Okay. That's me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I haven't been to Subway in so long that I, I'm already like, I don't even know what you guys, are. I'm just like. Oh, food. yeah, you're too good for it, eh, Mola? <laughs> <laughs> What if I'm not good enough for it? <laughs> oh. I feel like it would it would destroy my carefully cultivated brand if I ever admitted that I'd been to a subway. But um, but no, I actually genuinely haven't been to subway for ages. But I think what was the last one I had? I think the last one I had has some meatballs in it. I think, but that would be a very hazy memory because I was very drunk at the time. Well, there we go. You have your answer, sir. Uh, Ashurnabog says on EFAP 29 of watch through fun quote Henry Cavill is out as Superman deja vu much also watched oh all three indie movies on acid last weekend I'm ready for number five Christ yeah because it's just been a mess isn't it finding out whether or not what things are happening with DC for so many years now yep. I guess we have more definitive answers at this point uh, Hypnohype says, Hail Drinker, I was wondering if you have any yearly reviews planned. Maybe a top five net best or worst movies for 2022 would be fun to have a good stream as always. I mean, I usually do a, a roundup at the end of the year, giving my thoughts on it. So, wow, this year's been a doozy. <laughs> There'll be plenty to talk about. I think in Willow, I might have a contender for the single worst thing I've experienced this year. Is it worst or, fa- or favourite? Well, both, both, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. I, I would say my favorite movie of the year, I think, is Everything Everywhere All at Once. Excellent nice. pick. Fair play. Fair play. Pretty good. Uh, next <clears> one <throat> is Thunderstorm, who says, I don't drink, so others have more. Fair play. Thank you. We <laughs> will. Much of us. Scott Ski says, Make money? Why would you want to do that? Warner Brothers, probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Albi says, cheers. Cheers to you. John Orchard says, drinker supports the economy and makes you feel better about it, at least for a little while. Or, sorry, drinking <laughs> supports the economy. It does. I always feel good about it. Sam Wallace Art says, mule for Willow, I should kick you, or if I should forgive you, honestly, I don't think I can do either. Drinker, sad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I uh, think that was... Th- that, that, I might be crazy. That sounded like a Ragnarok reference, actually. The dialogue. There. I'm not sure. Not sure. Uh, it's been too too long. No Ragnarok uh, game. Rag- oh right. Okay. Probably not at that point yet. Uh, Elusiat says shekels, so you don't talk about us. But seriously, screw th- synthetic man. Love the work, gents. Yeah. <laughs> oh, synthetic man. Yeah. Well, he's a character by all accounts. Um. Sean Maka says, Drinker, you're the only YouTuber whose reviews have actually made me not watch shows. Thanks for suffering for the rest wow. of us. Damn. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I actually turning people away from entertainment. You're um, saving them. Yeah. Well, I'm saving them time, hopefully, and they can use it more productively, like masturbation or drinking or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
But uh, yeah, I, it makes me feel good at least when when people say like I wouldn't have watched this show, but you recommended it, and I thought I'll give it a try, and I really enjoyed it. That's that's always nice. Yeah, you know. Oh, that's yeah. that's tell you what, that's the that's the uh, the thirty eight second joke about my sexual performance. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Is actually uh, the, the the true reference of the thirty eight seconds is how long I lasted watching wheels of, uh, the wheel of time. <laughs> That's the, I got thirty eight seconds in. I was like, I'm out. I'm done. It is a very difficult wank. I can confirm. I, I'm, I'm gonna say, were you ma- were you wanking during it? Or is it, like, it was, there was no wanking involved at all. I'm afraid in that. <laughs> so is, isn't just, the opening? There's some weird line about like how men destroyed everything or something, yes. right? Yeah. And I was just like, I'm done. As soon as that was there, I was just like, I'm done. And that was like 38 seconds or something. Hmm. Uh, what, you didn't like the fact that the show actively hates you? Like, what are you, some <laughs> kind of bigot? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mikey Gussler says, I'm done with the DCU even before it's begun. I know everyone doesn't like the Snyder uh, like myself, but I know everyone loves Cavill. I'll engage in some other forms of DC content, but not the DCU. This better be a gotcha. Hmm. I don't think it is. I think he's gone. Um, mm. o- Oki Native says, uh, how much dollars do we need for Az to watch Willow? <laughs> There's a question. If it, if a drinker had only asked, I w- wouldn't have. You would have fucking died. Seriously, this was a tough one. I mean, look at and this it's... as your new Batwoman. No, I think National Treasure is the new Batwoman. <laughs> yeah. It's the new no, Batwoman... No. And it mated with Naomi. I've been meaning to ask about this. Like, what is it like? It's so good. Okay, imagine, <laughs> imagine this, right? This. Okay, it starts off. <laughs> I, I don't even know what I mean. I, I'll have you know TLDR. It starts off where it says uh, the conquistadors attack South America, and the Aztecs and the Incas uh, and the Mayans were all fighting together against them. No, they weren't. But. <laughs> Well, that's not, no. Uh, but when they said, and while that was going on, a group of an indigenous women ran off with, took, took all the riches so that they couldn't get them. And then they're, they're wearing this, this like symbol of a sun as a necklace, right? They, they must have got that pretty quick. You know, the, well, we're being invaded. Quick, somebody make a bunch of necklaces. <laughs> well, anyway, that's by the by. So anyway, it gets passed down from generation to generation of women. And and the, the lead girl who's early twenties, she gets the necklace when her mum dies. Her mum's been dead for a year. She's wearing the necklace. She fortuitously goes to see Harvey Keitel, who fortuitously is linked with her and her family through the Freemasons. When he d- <laughs> Dude, dies, how old is he now? By the way, uh, he uh, probably eighty, I'd say, around there, eighty, eighty-two, maybe. Hmm. And then she, when he dies, she breaks into his house by opening the door and walking in. And she's scrounging around on his bookshelf because she saw him turn a book and it opened up a secret thing. She does that. It opens up. There's a Masonic ring because he's a Mason. And she's like, ooh, uh, I, wonder, I wonder if I can move any other books, she says. So she just starts like fiddling the books, knocks one off, lands on the floor, opens up, just so happens to be on the page... It explains everything about the necklace that she's wearing. Aha! Wow, that was lucky, wasn't it? There is, there's, there's some, um, there's some Willow level <laughs> acting in this as well. So, like Mary, Mary Suarez is one of the worst actors <laughs> I've seen for quite some time. So the old guy when he dies, and she's told that he dies, and with this exact inflection, she says, "Oh no," <laughs> and that's basically it. Um, the, the unironically the line typical patriarchy is thrown in there's a point where sassy black queen Binary. kicks kicks a, a security guard out of a bathroom by leveraging all of the most interminable sort of progressive uh, this is systems of oppression how dare you deny my right to be in the bathroom etc ad nauseum um it's oh well oh, it's it's uh it's quite deliciously bad actually it's it's really something and Catherine Steve Jones has so much plastic surgery because she can barely speak. <laughs> Catherine Steve Jones. She in it, is she? Yeah, she kind of talks like this because she can't really. Uh, like, I saw her in Wednesday and I was like, she's looking a bit odd now. And she's going down that Nicole Kidman route. route. But I thought, well, you she know, Morticia Adams is a bit of a weird character. So maybe that's just part of the act. And, you know, maybe it's not now. Remember Zorro? 
Yeah. Oh, oh be she was beautiful. beautiful. She's Darling Buds of May. Absolutely gorgeous in the Darling Buds. I don't know. I, I like it when I can tell the villain of a piece just by the hairstyle that she has. That's, <laughs> Karen, that's another thing. Karen like, cut. You can look at... Because I, I shared the, um, the Disney Plus sort of loading screen for National Treasure, and someone said, you know, I, I wonder if you can sort of tell me who each character is just from left to right. And you actually can. So you have idiot you have mm. sassy black queen you have mary suarez mm -hmm. you have villain bitch woman you have a guy who has no personality at all and then you have oh that'll be the asian that's the one yep that's, like, that's okay the, there you go yep. that's the harvard <laughs> that, that's the harvard admission standard of asian personality and then you have um the far right is the edgy sort of rocker boyfriend guy and it's so obvious just from watching or just looking at the uh the poster who everyone is it's it really is. I, I, it's like Willow. I don't understand how this got made or how it ever got passed. It, it's really something special. But if you're a connoisseur of terrible media, then you're living in brilliant times. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's a good way, question, though, to turn things around a little bit. Richard Stamets says, What is a movie you can watch any number of times? I've seen The Goonies like a million times, even though it's got Kathleen Kennedy in the opening credits. So movies that are just infinitely rewatchable. Uh, I love watching Denzel Washington in The Equalizer all, all over and over. I could I would just watch that film like three times a year. I love it. Hmm. Um, probably Predator or T two. I could I could watch any time and and have a great old time with it. I don't know if you guys have got anything. Boring uh, answer would be Empire Strikes Back. Hipster answer would be Two Thousand and One: A Space Odyssey. <laughs> <laughs> so was this a movie we put on and uh for replayability sort of thing mm. like whenever we pretty watch? much yeah like something you can happily go back to and watch anytime i feel bad because enjoy i feel like we answered this on the last open bar one of the recent ones but I, my answer is oftentimes the cool natural trilogy i find that to be incredibly rewatchable hmm. yeah i'd go with that um as his wonky eyebrow says almost full house of british representation also hi as Funny fuck. <laughs> uh, He's big referencing that I'm, Norwegian, that I'm Norwegian. I'm Norwegian now. New Zealander. We got full blood British panel today. Yeah. Nice. Uh, big flipping boss says, you guys excited for Amazon's God of War? Oh, no. kill me. That's going to make me uh, very, very sad. Well, you, you've reached like the pinnacle of game-based storytelling, really, with the uh, with Ragnarok, haven't you? And now you're about to get a TV show shot out into your mouth. I'm so, so I'm so happy for where it is. That I don't want I don't want anyone touching it, especially not a fucking TV show that just makes it shit. Especially if the like, what are they adapting? If they adapt the fucking original games, that's going to be a mess because they're not going to do it uh, any justice at all. Are they? They're gonna hmm. they're gonna fuck with it. Um. Greg says, uh, just, well, nice and simple, hashtag fire James Gunn. <laughs> Not too impressed with the, the Cavill firing. Um, Canon Falderall says, Drinker, I just caught up on your catch-up stream from the last open bar, and here's another starting. The drink must flow. Cheers. Uh, yeah, it's just an endless wave of like catch-ups of catch-ups of catch-ups. Mm -hmm. What can we do? Um, Pyro Ronpa says, oh, hey, the little platoon. I recently came across your channel. Excellent work. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, James Ashton says, Drinker, Ace Works, sir. I've written a post-woke book, Movement by James Ashton, free on Apple and Amazon now. Your audience may love it. Zeitgeist is the word. I sent you an email uh, nailing post-woke questions about literary agents. Ta, no problem. I'll take a look. Uh, Lilac and Snowsberries gave me $20, so thank you. Uh, X Purple Thighs says, Little Platoon here. <laughs> I'm good. Is that a, Yennefer, a, a sort of Yennefer-esque reference? What? Instead of lilac and gooseberries, lilac and schnozberries. <laughs> I don't know. So it kind of mixes in with Willy Wonka there. But... Yeah. These snozberries taste like snozberries. Um, <laughs> yeah, Purple Thigh says, little platoon is in here. I'm going to coom. Well, there you go. <laughs> the effect you have start, on people. I've, I've been looking for channel merch ideas, and maybe just tissues is a good idea. But we'll <laughs> yeah. um, Solid Oge says, if you get the chance, check out Devotion. Great film. Cool. Uh, Gunstar1 says, now that Cavill is out as Superman, maybe he could work on his goal on getting a Warhammer 40k TV series going. My question is, how would anyone pull that off with all of that lore? The Horus Heresy is like 54 books alone. 
Uh, yeah, there's deep lore there. But I feel like Cavill's the man who's got it all contained within his head. There'll be no heresy on his part. He'll get everything right. Oh. Uh, Disney Sunquist says, Hey, mate, first off, uh, when is the Pirates Happy Hour coming? And what are you all doing for Christmas? And how exactly is Shazam supposed to fit in? Hey, Az. So, Hi. Hey. <laughs> uh, when am I going to do a Pirates Happy Hour? Eventually. That's my best answer. What are we all doing for Christmas? I would imagine we're all going to be eating and drinking and making merry. Yeah. Just as a wild guess. Um, I'll be here on Christmas Day streaming for you. My Christmas nice. is Monday. This coming Monday. Ah. Unconventional. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Lucas says, Hey, Drinker, what's your favourite Munro? I assume you mean the mountains. Um, phew, probably Marilyn. Ben. Yeah. <laughs> Probably Ben Nevis, actually, because the views up there are spectacular. And it's one of the only ones that I've done more than once. I think I've climbed that three times now. And, yeah, if you get it on a good day, you can actually be above the clouds and you can watch them drifting by below you, which is pretty cool. So that's probably it. Uh, Dan says, hey, Drinker, what would be the worst recast for the new Superman? Logan Paul or Timothy Chalamet? <laughs> oh, that's a tough one, actually. Fuck it, Michael Sierra. Come on, do it, Michael Sierra. Uh, no, I think the worst casting would be um, Mark Ruffalo. Oh, probably. <laughs> Fucking waterbed that he is. <sighs> <laughs> waterbed. <laughs> I'm just saying he's let himself go a bit in recent years. <laughs> he's starting to look his age. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I can't see. Um, well, if I had to pick between Timothy Chalamet or Logan Paul, I'd probably pick Logan Paul, actually. Give the man a chance. Um, Easy E says, Hear me out. Next decade after the message is cleared out of Hollywood, they make a Super Sun style movie with Cavill and Batfleck as older Super Dads. With Super Dad bods, I guess. Um, I, I think they'll be long gone by then. I mean, I don't mean they'll be dead or anything. They'll just have no interest in it. Um... The Gourd King says the Cavalcade wants him as 007. Odds of this? I don't know what we reckon. What's his chances being Bond at this point? I don't want him as Bond because the next Bond's going to be a disaster. So, yeah. Don't do it to my boy. But if he doesn't do that, what's poor, what's poor Henry going to do? I feel like he's just going to be like a an abandoned puppy just left out there. Hopefully Argyle's good. Yep. <laughs> I've got nothing I can add to that. <laughs> yep. Uh, Lilac and Snozberry says, Recently finished Redemption. Anyone who says Drinker is a misogynist because he doesn't subscribe to the woke Hollywood agenda has clearly never read this. Anya's an absolute badass. Thank you very much. And, uh, yeah, glad you enjoyed it, man. Uh, Hose Acontra Raz says, Remember, Gunn told Cena not to read the source material. I don't know if that's true, did he? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, John Cena said that, I think. Okay. Why? Um, Wouldn't that just... I guess even if you're going to deviate from the source. It, but, like, but, 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 but... All right, whatever. <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to sit in my corner and be sad. I mean, I guess when you're dealing with an actor, and I, I use the term actor pretty loosely, like John Cena, like, you know, not a guy with a huge amount of, like, experience and range. You it maybe... can't hurt, right? <sighs> What was I'm the justification? Sure. There was a justification given when um I don't remember if it was somebody at Marvel who came out and said that we actively select against people who've been who are very familiar with the source material because uh, if you come in with preconceived ideas about what the character is or should be, then you're closed off to the new directions that we want to take them in. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if that was the sort of the predominant idea that goes around, but it just seems so very bizarre I think if i were ever cast in one of these roles the first thing i would do was would be to read the source material learn the character so much of your work's already been done for you you don't necessarily need to reinvent something which is already established and good yeah do you think from their point of view it's like we don't want anyone arguing against all the dumb decisions that we've <laughs> made that that go against all the established lore i guess yeah, i would not be surprised at all because um, yeah i imagine like well, on something like The Witcher, for example, where they clearly have a creative vision that's wildly different from the books and oh. the games. 
And then you, suddenly you've got guys like Henry Cavill there who are like, well, it wouldn't be like this and this character doesn't make any sense. And it's like, from their point of view, it must be like their worst nightmare. This guy constantly correcting them on everything. Um, which, you know, from, from the audience's point of view, he's exactly what you need. He's like your advocate there. But yeah, I can see how it causes problems with getting things done. Uh, Alex says, what if Cavill was in on it just to boost Black Adam? Ooh. Surely no. not. Mm. Then he didn't do a very good job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Stuart Fields says, love the Willow breakdown. Uh, do you think the characters are written in that way because that is the writer's experience of life and the type of people they surround themselves with? Yes, I absolutely do. Those personalities are their reality. Uh, yeah, I think so. And it's like they seem to have no imagination and no life experience, so they just write what they know. And what they know is pampered, spoiled, useless yeah. arseholes. <laughs> I mean, that's that's all I got, really. Um, that deserves a bat signal lighting up. Yeah. Mike Waterfield says, <laughs> the sad part of the Black Superman by Mr. I'm glad September the 11th responders burned is still getting his flick. Uh, is he? I, I, I just think it's because it hasn't been announced as cancelled. I think... By the sounds that people are reading. I mean, it's been told that it's still, still, you know, the first, the draft has been done. I don't think this film's ever going to see the light of day. Is yeah, this I'd the Ta-Nehisi Coates one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The Ta-Nehisi Coates racist piece of shit. Well, it's, it's nihilism as much as it is anything. I mean, he's such an astonishingly nihilistic guy. It's a really, really sort of cancerous strain of intellectualism as well, which is this... That you cannot have rapprochement between races. You are destined to live in a world of oppressed versus oppressor. It's all of the worst stuff that we have to criticize about modern pop culture. You can find a lot of that in what Tanahisi Coates writes. And, you know, he's been involved in lots of the Black Panther comics recently. It would be probably the height of, of the most bitter kind of irony if you got a Superman film out involving Tanahisi Coates before you got another one with Henry Cavill, or instead <laughs> of one with Henry Cavill. Because, it, it, I mean, nihilism is the best way of describing that. There, there are other, you know, black intellectuals in the US who would describe Tanahisi Coates as a nihilist. He's, he's not a pleasant guy. Imagine what kind of reception it would get, though, if he actually released that film. And he wrote <laughs> oh Captain God. America as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Barclay Brown says, I'm genuinely confused by what audience they are creating this 10-year plan for. Axing Henry alienates most of the current DC fans, and will younger audiences even care about these characters in 10 years? Pff, your guess is as good as mine, but yeah, like, it doesn't... Getting rid of him seems to be, like, alienating the last remaining, like, shred of loyalty that people have for the DCU. So it's, it's a really odd choice. Um, Graham Gallagher says, Mauler, a little late in noticing it, but Netflix removed Community Season 2, Episode 14, Dungeons and Dragons because of Chang's makeup. To hell with suicide prevention, no dark paint allowed. That joke is one of my favorites in all of Community. It is fucking hilarious, and I'm so sad they got rid of it. For those who don't know, they're setting up a game of D&D, &D, and Chang, who's like always controversial, he's played by Ken Jong, I think is his name. He, he always says things that are inappropriate and is always blah, blah, blah and stuff. The episode begins and we see each of the characters. They're all just looking normal, except him, who's full blackface, just, just pitch <laughs> dark. And he's wearing like a white wig. And um, uh, the black, like, you know, characters are especially fucking pissed at it. And uh, Shirley goes, uh, are we just going to ignore that hate crime? And he goes, I'm a dark elf, actually. <laughs> and um, I think at one point, Britta says, I can excuse racism, but uh, the, the, something misogynistic happens. She says, I can excuse racism, but misogyny? And then Shirley says, you can excuse racism. <laughs> like, those are really great jokes that come off of a character being inappropriate, right? Which is, uh, there's, there's other episodes of The Office that have amazing comedy as a result of that. But yeah, we wouldn't want to upset anybody, so we got to get rid of them. It's just like, yeah. what? I can't wait till we eventually live in this world that like all these people are, are finally content with where we've eliminated anything even mildly controversial or offensive and it's just this like horrifying sea of like bland grey sludge. <laughs> like there's just nothing. Because no, um, there'll never be nothing as soon as you've settled on a commonly agreed non inoffensive framework 
then someone will come along and say, well, this aspect of it is actually offensive now, so you can't show that either. You'll never reach the end point of that. It's it's a permanent mm. chain mm-hmm. of destruction. Um, it's Ever also an argument for circles. Yeah, it's an argument for physical media as well. If you go to watch any like South Park on Amazon, um, the Super Best Friends episodes where they show the Prophet Muhammad are, are gone. You can't watch them anywhere. So the only way to watch that is either via dodgy streaming services or buy the actual physical copy. Um, it's it's a it's a worrying trend, but it's it's there are ways around it. Buying the thing rather than effectively renting it from a streaming service is probably a good start. By yeah. the way, uh, fully recommend watching, especially the first three seasons of Community. Another thing that happens is they need to make a school mascot, but they don't want to make it anything in particular that could be offensive. And so they have this board, the the the, the school dean and several of the people who are very much sensitive about social issues are like, all right, so what we need to do is avoid anything that could be seen as stereotyping from mascot. For example, and they've got these columns and they're like, can't have Jewish nose, can't have, they like, have like, <laughs> list all the ones you could imagine. And the, a character comes in, they eventually settle on this horrifying, like featureless <laughs> zombie as their mascot. <laughs> and uh, they ask one of the characters like, what, what do you think? And he goes, I think not being racist is the new racist. <laughs> like, which kind of sums up what's going on these days it is right so like you know when um, there was the monkeypox epidemic around and it was decided at the world health organization that it would be racist to call it the monkeypox so you have to rename it well okay who's being, the, who's being um who's being racist there who's making that association because it's no one in the actual real world who's doing that it's the people who've renamed it in the bid to be anti-racist who have made a racist association in the name of anti-racism and that kind of stuff happens all the time jews must have big noses well why no that's like if you're pointing that out if you're saying to jk rowling you've depicted goblins and i they remind me of jews you are the one being the racist you are the problem yes <laughs> yeah well, yeah, nine times out of ten, it's just them projecting their own inner biases and, and bigotry onto other people and being like, oh, well, because I pointed it out, that makes me a good person. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's, you're only pointing it out because you thought about it in the first place. Uh, yeah. It's monkeypox for a reason, a very specific reason that the first word is very important about the origination of the... So if you want to associate monkeys with... A racial aspect, then uh, I, I think you're the racist. I think you're the racist. Um, moving on to the next one is Hikira, who says Cavill gets fired before they remove Amber Heard. I'm sticking to DC animated movies where Jensen Ackles is Red Hood. DC live action just isn't worth acknowledging. Um, yeah, tough to argue with that one. Uh, Yora Drox says should have made one more Superman movie with Cavill and then scrapped DC movies altogether. It's foobar at this point and too late to start a new DCEU. Yeah, I was no, saying no. you could do that as a sort of just goodbye. Uh, yeah, give them all one last shot or something like that. I don't know. But then uh, it then it does one point two billion. Yeah, yeah, and then they're like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we exactly. can do more. <laughs> The next one is Big Dave K, who says, If everyone decided to stop going to these films, would they keep making this tripe? They have to know by now that their approach isn't working. I mean, yeah, I mean, if every single one of them flopped, you'd have to think they, they wouldn't make them anymore. This is this is why DCE, uh, sorry, DC keeps flopping like backwards and forwards, trying to find a new path and not able to decide on anything because it's like they recognize the problem, they just don't seem to know how to solve it and they don't have the money or the balls to like stick with any strategy for more than a year or so before they oust everyone and bring in whole new management with a whole new set of plans and objectives and it just keeps keeps doing that that's why they've not achieved anything we have uh, uh an avatar 2 reviewing from d-day cobra oh yeah what's he saying i absolutely loved avatar the way of water it's visually stunning beyond belief with good action, good performances, and a solid story built around a father protecting his family. James Cameron really did something special with this one. Oh, right. Yeah. I kept waiting for, for him to be like, but it was shit. <laughs> no, I thought you no. were going sarcastic with I was going to say, second, Gary's just tweeted, and he's just put, it just keeps going, Avatar, Way of the Water. <laughs> it's the <laughs> duality of man right there. I know. <laughs> it's gonna be a fun Friday night ties tomorrow. Oh dear. Alright. Next one is 
Uh, Jester of Roanoke, who says, DCEU is the make-a-wish kid of the cinematic universes. (laughs) 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 I mean, the the dark universe was the stillborn child, really. (laughs) It just didn't even get anywhere. Yeah. Uh, John Orchard says, preach as preach. There you go, that's all he got. (laughs) Just keep preaching. I'll try. Um, Mad About Hatter says, probably a recurring question tonight, but who would you guys recast as Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Aquaman, etc.? Or are we all for Jennifer Lawrence to play every role? (laughs) I would say, yeah, I'd go with that. (laughs) I don't want to talk about anyone playing Superman at this point. Sick of it. I, I hate I it. I don't know who. I honestly don't know who. It's going to be some unknown that when we see them, we go, oh, I guess I could see how they could be Superman, maybe. I'm assuming that's who they'll go with. Just just pick some fucking bodybuilder or something. Just cast him. I say bring bring back Nick Cage. He never got a chance to play him. He was yeah. all set to do it back in the 90s. Yeah. Make it happen. Uh, no, not fun. Yeah, I was going to uh, say, just The Death of Superman is such an amazing documentary. It's so good. Yeah, it is. It's how to waste like $30 million and not achieve a single thing. <laughs> like like, like uh, a Game of Thrones spin-off series. Yep. Uh, Thunderstorm says, nihilistic or woke Superman? No thanks, DC. Indeed. Uh, and I'll do one more. Red Ronin says, was hoping to see Campbell's Superman fight Brainiac. Very disappointed and mm. let down by the choice to part ways with him. Now, there we go. We see we could have had Nick Cage doing that. 20 <sighs> years ago, he could have been fighting Brainiac. Written by Kevin Smith. Yeah. Oh, Kev. Still crying? I was, yeah, well, hell yeah, he is. Didn't he, didn't he lash out at, at Anna? Yeah. In an interview where he's like, "Ah, oh, there's some chick called that Star Wars girl telling me to man up." It's like, "Well, I've spent my whole life trying to like, no, sorry, the past twenty years trying not to be a man." <laughs> like, well, mission yeah, accomplished, okay. Kev. He was talking about <laughs> how he, his father was austere and 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 being able to cry was like a, a big thing. And I'm just like, that's all fair and good if you're crying at something legitimate. You know, the passing of somebody special, a friend, a family member. Uh, you know, something really heartfelt. Crying because you want a job at Marvel. Look, I cry that the Black Panther 2s give me job, please. That's... Or, or crying at Rise of Skywalker. Or the, the Flash. Oh, me. The CW <laughs> Flash. Where she goes, run, Barry, run. And it's like... Aah. Fucking... That, he's gone. He's lost. He's, I think it's it, someone needs to explain to him as well, like the the law of diminishing returns with that sort of thing. Like uh, if someone who chooses to openly show emotion like that one time, that's the kind of card you can play once, and it's really impactful. If you start doing it at every film and every TV show that you go see, it kind of becomes meaningless very quickly. There's something wrong with your emotional state. Yeah. Hey ho though. Um, We've uh, we've been streaming for quite a while, and I know there's still a bunch of super chats left over, and we'll do that in a catch up stream in a few days, so not to worry. But I want to say thank you to all you gentlemen for joining joining us tonight. Um, been a pleasure having you both on. Thank you. Yeah. And, thank um, you. Thank you for ev- for everyone who's watching. Um, As he's plushy is still available to order, so please go for it. And remember, please to subscribe to both of these guys. Uh, Little Platoon, you're not far away from 100k now, I believe. Yeah, I, I was looking back. Uh, my I Got 100 Subs video went up today, one year ago. So I think I'm now 90, coming up for 91,000. So yeah, pushing pushing 100. That will hopefully be by January. Um, but yeah, in the in the, the pipeline, there's Wakanda Forever Part 3, which will be out this weekend. Avatar should be out the following weekend. I have a second channel, which is called Lost Chord, which is linked on my main one, which if anyone wants shorter stuff, that's on there. And the other thing which I'm now legally ally- uh, allowed to plug is um, Judas, the new game from uh, the Bioshock people. I'm doing a little bit of writing for them. So if you haven't seen the trailer, head over to Ghost Story Games and check it out. It's, it's yeah, it's uh, that's exciting stuff. That's How awesome. did, uh, am I allowed to know? How did that happen, that connection? Um, I, I just got chatting with um, with Ken Levine um, and he, he asked if I was available to, to you know come on and have a look at some stuff for them. And I said, uh, I'll think about it. Um, 
yeah no but obviously the answer was yes no yeah no he just got in touch on twitter and um yeah it's it's a very strange year this one's been but it's did um did, was it like a video of yours or something you said or that made him want to reach out um i uh i can't say like, a huge amount about sort of the reasons why but like, there's a specific uh interest set that he was quite interested in, in getting input on like or from someone with that interest set because like my background is is sort of mix of philosophy obviously media criticism politics as well um and uh, apparently he thought i could be useful in some capacity so i i hope that i am being we will see when it comes out if i'm in the credits or not but uh it's no yeah that's that's good fun it's it's been a really really exciting writer's room to be working in um and uh yeah if you haven't checked the trailer out take a look and i can i can pretty much guarantee it's not going to be quite what you're expecting it to be but i can't say too much more than that as long as it's not bioshock infinite okay <laughs> 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 but yeah, I no, would that's, pass that's, that on, but I want to keep the job. So, oh, uh, yeah, don't pass that on. Yeah, <laughs> that's not a good idea. But um, no, that's awesome news, and uh, let's hope it all works out in the best way possible. Yeah, congratulations, man. That's that's great to hear. Much um, obliged. But yeah, thank you for everyone else that's tuned in to watch this. I think we were up at about thirteen, fourteen thousand tonight. So that's not oh, a bad wow. total, I would say. Uh, thank you for all the awesome super chats. Thanks for being so generous. And uh, to my mods as well, thank you for doing the same awesome job that you guys always do. It's very much appreciated. But anyway, well, for now, that's all we got for today. So go away now. Bye. Bye.